Hello. Oh, Jeremy, you're a brave one. Oh my goodness. You're here today and you also got a one-to-one -one with Todd later on. You're fearful yeah. today. Yeah. <laughs> it's Friday. It's Friday. <laughs> Love it. Hello, so good to see you guys. I'm so looking forward to to the Q and A's every time. It's really nice. Still waiting for people to enter. I would like to do a meditation today when we start, where we're looking into the identification of the body. Um, we have a very subtle identification with our body, which we are normally not aware of. Um, when we normally talk about identification with the body, it's we go like, yeah, well, my arm, and I can see through that it's not really my arm, and my, you know, heart, my lungs, my intestines, and it's very easy to see through that in the first feather. Um, but there's a very, very subtle identification with the body that we're not really aware of, and that's what I would like for us to look into today in the meditation before we start. So if you make yourself comfortable, it's not going to be a long one. I haven't got anything planned, so it might end up before hours, who knows? So far, it's not supposed to be a long one, but we'll see. But make yourself, make yourself comfortable and close your eyes and make a deep breath in. And exhale and feel how your body is falling into gravity. And take another deep breath in and exhale and feel how the body gets heavy. And continue breathing calmly, but have a focus on every exhalation. That's why every exhalation you do, you get more and more heavy. And then let go of the breath and let it take care of itself. So you breathe as if you are asleep where the breath is just taking care of itself. And just see if you can focus on your feet and your ankles and your knees. And the hips. And make a kegel. While you inhale, feel the attention going up through the spine to the top of your head. And exhale, let go of the kegel. And focus on the entire torso on the front. And on the back. On the right side and the left side. And above you and below you. And feel how the body gets really heavy. And as I said, this meditation is to bring a focus on the very, very subtle identification we have with the body. So I would like for you to focus on your face. Feel into the muscles around the eyes. See if you can relax the muscles. There's normally a tension there that feels like it goes very, very deep into kind of like the middle 
of the head. See if you can relax that tension in the eyes. And when you relax the tension in your eyes, what happens with the brow? Do you feel that it's relaxing too in a different way? Keep breathing. Focus on your nostrils. Feel how your nose is relaxing. Notice the inhalation through the nose, where it's cold at the tip of the nose. And the exhalation where it's warm at the tip of the nose. Just notice, because your focus is on your face, just notice, notice when you make an inhalation that it's like the air goes in through the nose, through the windpipe, into the lungs. At, a, at some point, the oxygen becomes you. But because your focus is on your face, it's something that is happening in what feels to be the depth, something under the face. Into the body somewhere, below the face. Feel the tension around your mouth, your chin. the muscles that are chewing your food. See if you can relax those. It's usually those muscles that makes you grind your teeth. So put the tip of your tongue up in the palate and see if you can relax those muscles and then feel the connection with those muscles and your bum. When you relax those muscles in the jaw, you automatically relax the muscles in your bum. But again, keep the focus on the face. So what is happening in the bum, it feels like it's something that is happening way down below the face. Feel into the skin where your hair is attached. If there's any kind of tension anywhere just breathe into that tension. Feel into your ears, where they are attached, if there's any tension there. And just relax the entire face. Now, as I said, this med meditation was about the identification with the body. And what I would like for you to bring your attention to now is that mental image you have created about your face. You have seen your face for your inner eye all this time. When I talked about your eyes, your nose, your hairline, your jaw. You saw that as a mental image, as a picture of you. Now what I would like for you to notice is the identification with that image. So it's very, very easy when we talk about identification with the body to let go of that. Yes, I know it's not my face. Yes, I know it's not my arms, my torso. Yes, I know it's just a meat suit. That identification is easy. But what is so resistant, it's the identification with the inner image of all that.
So I would like for you now to zoom into the image that you have of your face. It is a thought, obviously. So all this time while we have been in this meditation, you have been in thought. You were not present in the here now. You thought you were because your focus was on that mental image of your face. So how is that part of your identification? Do you see that that mental image is how you see you? Do you see that mental image is how you think they see you? Do you feel how there's identification with both? Both how you see that mental image as you and how you think they see you in that mental image. But this is what is a posted on a post-it, on a post-it, on a post-it. It's such a deep, deep level of identification that we're not even aware of. So what I would like for you to take away from this meditation and in the coming week, When you are in conversation with others, when you are going for a walk, when you look in the mirror, before you fall asleep, and that's the first thing when you wake up, check in with that mental image. Look into the identification that is happening on that level and question it. It is nothing but another thought about a thought. Okay, I'd like for you to make a deep breath in. Focus on your nose. Either the physical one or the mental one. <laughs> And exhale, roll your shoulders, move your neck, and open your eyes when you're ready. Thank you very much. So in the week to come, see if you can notice that level of identification and see if you can notice the connection between the very crude identification of an eye that we have, the one that is very, very easy to let go of, and then into that much more subtle level of an eye that is not even formulated, that we're not even aware of is there. And just be curious about your experience when you're there. Okay. Who want to go first? There we go. Let me just get you. Look at me. Hello, my friend. Hi, Fernanda. Oh, as always, your meditations are wonderful. Um, and it kind of inspired the question. You know, when I'm doing the work, and sometimes I get so overwhelmed, and as always, I attempt to um, come into the body and feel the sensations, but sometimes I find myself just crying out for help, like from the higher, or praying, you know, have mercy, you know. So uh, as a curiosity, um, where does 
asking for help from the higher or prayer fit into the fetters? Is that a ritual? Is that something that's identification? How, how best could I use that? Well, I, I really love that you're bringing it up. Um, when we have a background in any type of religion, no matter if it was a cult or if it's an acknowledged religion, um, anything that where there's a higher deity, whether it's a god or the universe or anything that is higher than us, um, then there is um, there is identification happening on the level where we believe that there's something bigger than us. And that is what is dissolved in the eighth fetter. The eighth fetter is paired with the first fetter. That is about identification of self. And in the first fetter, I, I pose the question, who am I? Hmm. In the eighth fetter, I pose the question, am I? Because it's, it's where we let go of, I see it a bit as when we have religion and when we have um Neo Advaita Vedanta and we have the universe and something bigger. Um, I have no problem with, like you say, that sometimes you're just crying out for help. You know, please help me. Please have my back. I can't see my way out of this. Please be there and support me. Um, I, I completely support you in doing that. I'm quite sure that when you get to the eighth fella, you're going to see through that. Until then, I view it very much like training training wheels on a bike. You know, that before you can bike on your own, you need training wheels on. And some kids are wearing the, the training wheels way, way after they have learned how to bike. But it just feels a bit more comfy to have them. And that's how I view what you're talking about. So I have no need for anybody to rush in and dissolving that sensation of something bigger than me. I also see it as a very healthy, if we have a childhood and if we have tra trauma where we were absolutely abandoned on every single level that we could be abandoned emotionally, intellectually, psychologically, you know, spiritually, every single level who we were abandoned physically, you know, Every single level we were abandoned, we had to have, because we were children, we had to have something to rely on. We had to have something to have our back. And normally we created some kind of ideal. Usually it's an ideal parent that the other parent was the problem. But this parent, the ideal parent, that was the parent that was actually also a victim for the cruel parent. So we create a story like that where obviously... That is not the case. Both were as abusive. One was abusive, you know, outwardly. The other one was abusive with closing the eyes. Um, being a witness and not helping. But as a child, we can't deal with that. We need somebody to have our back. And until you're completely okay with seeing through all of it and seeing that there really is no one in here or up there until that is possible i would like for you to stay where you are it's completely fine and asking for help and saying thank you and being grateful and feeling that you have a connection with something um that gives you calm in your life i'm completely on board with that i think that's it's fine absolutely fine um it's funny when we have a group where where there are people that everybody has seen through the lower fives and they're working with, <clears throat> excuse me, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, it's so clear to see who are in the eight fetter because the eight fetter people are the ones that are happy. I'm, I'm one with everything, you know, nothing matters. Oh, that's fine. You know, I get an extra bill from taxation it's fine. Everything's going to sort itself out. You know, it's just beautiful and, you know, everything. And I'm part of the whole. I'm part of, of, of the one and all of that. That's very much an eight feather 
being. Mm. And everybody that has passed that, uh, you know, going like, stay there as long as you can, because you will crash, you know, you will see through it. And life will not be, you know, all unicorns and corns and rainbow. Because there is identification of that. And that's why it's paired with the first one. So I, I hope I supported you in being completely fine and okay where you are, but also knowing that that you can work with it, with the feathers. That was so beautiful. And it was very, um, how you presented it, gentle and um, allowing and open to other possibilities. Yeah. yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good, good. I'm happy about that. Yeah, and really, you know, allow yourself to be where you are with full acceptance and love and compassion to where you are. Yeah, you're not in a rush. What, what, what a, which goal are you supposed, you know, to reach when there isn't any, you know? So just, it's completely fine. As long as you have that feeling of being held. Also, if you just, you know, look at it, if anyone comes from a traumatic background where there were no one to reach a point in your life where you feel safe and where you feel held and where you feel that I can ask for support, I can ask for help, I can rely into and I can say thank you for seeing this beautiful view and I can say thank you for waking up and one morning without pain. I might get pain five minutes later, but I woke up without pain and I can say thank you for that. That feeling of somebody having your back that's an improvement from a very, very traumatic background. So stay in that as long as you need. And you will automatically, you know, let go of the training wheels when you don't need them anymore. So there's no rush and no no need to be forceful about it at all. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There it is. Hello. Oh, you're muted, Lisa. Yeah, good morning. <clears throat> Beautiful. Morning. What a lovely interaction you just had. That really, whoo, that just sent me into a real bliss or something anyway. Um, so I had two questions. And the first one relates to the meditation, which was really lovely. And then at the very end, you start talking about the image you have of yourself and so, what well, am I doing it wrong? I couldn't, I didn't feel like I have an image. I don't see my nose. I don't see my ears. It's more like if you say, you know, notice the air going in and out of your nostrils that I directly notice the air going, I don't have an image, but then I thought, well, golly, I'm an image based person and I always have been. So I thought, where, what's going on? Am I bypassing something here by not seeing myself necessarily? Uh, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think that there's a lot of identify. I'm not pointing at you in any way. I'm just speculating now on what you're saying. And it's just back forth ping pong conversation. I'm not pointing directly at you with this. Um, I think that in the non-duality and in the feta community, there's a lot of identification with no not identifying. There's there's um there's a problem in that <laughs> in that we kind of rush into the non-identifying. We kind of rush into, but there is no I. And by that, there's a lot of bypassing happening. And it's where Todd and I really enjoy slowing down and zooming in and really looking into all the small, you know, uh, nooks and crannies that we have um, hidden away where identification is. Because there, there are many, many different ways of identifying that is much more subtle than a nose. Like if you get a huge pimple on your nose, then you might not have an issue with the pimple itself, but underneath there might be the identification that you project onto others. You know, like I said, that how you think other people see you, that identification. So it's not how you see you in the mirror. It's not that subtle and, de and de 
Ident First, this is a very gross identification. I have a pimple on my nose. I don't want a pimple on my nose. That is very, very easy to look through. Then there's the more psychological level that, um, what does this mean? Why do I have a pimple on my nose? Is there something I'm not aware of? Is there something I need to look into? Um, that can be seen through as well. Then there's the the shame of walking around with it, both for me and for other people. And then we get to the to the level that I was pointing out in the meditation, that you have an image of you that is now disrupted because you have a pimple on your nose and that is not part of how you, how you view you. For example, every time you look in the mirror, have you experienced sometimes to get surprised by the old woman looking back at you? I saw a picture of myself, my, my son, he had his 29th birthday yesterday. And my dad sent me a picture of Ben's first Christmas. And I was sitting with him at, at the table, trying, trying to save all the things on the table that he was reaching out. You know, one year old is reaching out for everything. And I was sitting, you know, trying to move all the things out of his grasp so he wouldn't pull the entire Christmas dinner down. <laughs> uh, that picture, I'm about 28. And it was really funny looking at it and going like, oh my goodness, that's how I see myself like that. That is how I see myself. Clearly, it's not how I look, you know? I'm not 28. So there's at my inner identification with who, how I see me is not in line with how I see myself in the mirror. There's a discrepancy in that identification. When there's a discrepancy in there, it's also, for example, when we can have issues uh, with our body, like if we gain weight, if we lose weight, if we start to get wrinkles or saggy boobs or anything like that, that we can have, can have an issue with that. There are multiple levels to have an issue with that. First of all, the gross identification with the body, but then it's more the subtle level, level where the inner picture I have of my body is not with wrinkles and saggy boobs or five kilos or 10 pounds more heavy or whatever. So it's more that level that the identification is with. Did I answer your question? I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, I hear you like the like what you said about um, the image you have of yourself is the one of you with your baby when you're 28 years old or whatever. That's where that there are definitely I mean, I, there's almost every morning when I walk into the bathroom, I see what I don't expect to see in a way. It's like, oh, OK, yeah, it's, it's not different. good. Or, it's not good or bad. It's just it's not. Different. Exactly. It's different. It's different than than the mental image identification that you have on you. So when you say I don't really identify with my nose, imagine that you get cancer and you get half of your nose operated away. As the most of us would be OK on the level with. I mean, things happen. We all get sick. We all if we are fortunate, get old and we all die. This is just how this is happening to me getting cancer, my nose is operated away, you know, but there would be an image of you with a nose that would not correlate with the image of you not having half of your nose. So how is that a problem or, I mean, not you know, what, no, I, no, no, so no. how is it significant? Because the fact that I didn't really have an image of myself as you were going through the, the meditation, I wanted to get in the mind and like, what? What's going on with not having an image of? It's because you're bypassing. You're too quick. Mm. Imagine, imagine the things where you say, "I don't identify with that." Imagine that it's not there. Well, I'm not saying I don't identify. I want to be clear about that because I don't think about. I mean, you the very first statement you said about people identifying and they're identify with identifying or whatever. I thought I don't. I don't know if I think that way. I don't think that I do, but I might be wrong. I mean, I've been discovering an awful lot about how I have an idea about a certain thing and then it really isn't so as I start to really look under the layers. So I'm really investigating these areas where there's a bit of a, a mismatch between what actually seems to be happening and what appears to be the what's being tried to be brought out. Like you say, look, look at that image of yourself. So I don't feel like 
Yeah, I just don't, I don't know what to say. But when you say that, for example, I do not identify with my nose. All I'm doing is questioning if that is true, because I think you do. Well, I don't know. I don't even know what that means, that I identify with my nose. Okay, imagine your face. If you close your eyes and imagine your face, do you have a nose? Yeah, I mean, apparently I don't. There you go. That's the, mental, that, that's the mental picture and the, the issue, what I was pointing out in the med meditation, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. None of this is a problem. I mean, we are in, we're in the cherry on the top gravy part, you know, of, of identification, looking at it, but it's just the very, very subtle identification that we normally do not pay any attention to. Okay. So when we you. move into the higher fives, this is the area that we are working in. Okay. So I'm not talking about gross identification at all. I'm talking no, no, about I, yeah. that, that, made that very, very subtle identification that is happening without you being aware of it. So it's only for you to go, oh, I am identification with a nose. I think I have one when I close my eyes. So you still have an image about you. And that image is what you're identifying with as a baseline. That is the okay. starting point of all identification that is happening on the higher fives. It does feel awfully subtle, but, but I do, I hear you. And what I would say is because, you know, I did the, uh, the headless way was where I got a really big pop when I went through the finders course. Mm -hmm. And since then there is a sense of there actually being no head. I mean, literally like right now, I don't have any, I can see if I look, I can see a little shadow of the end of my nose, but I don't, it doesn't mean anything. In other words, there's a sensation of there is no head here. There's just a room and a view of the computer. And all that. but I, I want to be sure I'm not like bypassing. So you are. You are. Yeah. You are. Did you have, have you looked in the mirror today? Yes. There you go. Why would you look in the mirror if you don't have a head? <laughs> so that the that this face doesn't look so bizarre like it does when I first there look at it. In the there you go. There you go. That's okay. exactly it. <clears throat> you have an identification where you think that if you don't look in the mirror, people will see you in a certain way. That is how that is your self image projected onto other people. That is a, that is a very very subtle identification. Even but though I can't like find it, like I can't look in the cognitive thing and actually see an image doesn't mean it's not there it's much more subtle. Right. you have okay. an image where you believe that that looking in a mirror will have any influence on that on that on that image right right okay i i i'm, I'm clear on that now thank you for helping me get straight on that <laughs> yeah very nice um it's 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 those very very subtle levels um, we talked about it the other day, Todd and I were asking him, have you looked in the mirror? And he was like, no. And we found out that not, none of us are looking in the mirror. We're checking that we don't have stuff in our teeth and that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. So it's, it's right. with that, even with that checking that there's not like, you know, spinach in Black the thing. even yeah. that is an identification that I know that there's something here that is perceived in a certain way out there, yeah. that is identification. Totally, I get it. Because the only time I'm really concerned is with like, I mean, I live alone and so I stay at home a lot and I, with my animals, you know, I'm kind of a ratty mess a lot of the time, which is, you know, fits my lifestyle. But when I get ready to go to town or gonna whatever it is, or we're gonna get on the Zoom, hey, no. yes. So just my hair. Yeah, just look into that. And it's not it's not that there's any problem with it. There's no yeah, problem with right. it at all. No, I it's actually just, think it's, it's it's just really, really slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and zoom in. Where is the identification right now? What inner picture do you have? What inner projection do you put on other people? What is that talking about? What is that telling you about? So the moment you think that there's no, there's no identification anymore, you're too quick. Well, I don't think that. Clearly, I don't. That's why I'm here, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and so great, great. Um, it's funny because there's an idea that the reason that I do those things, like check your teeth and stuff, is not for myself, but for for whoever I'm interacting with. 
there we go there's identification in that what what sure. yeah what is the what is the what is the story behind that identification yeah Mm -hmm. there's a very it, it just gets more and more subtle it's like it's just a whisper at the end but it's still identification oh totally i can really see it at that level sure yeah it's like you know needing to be not rejected or seen as less than or inappropriate or whatever that all that is yeah i totally get that without taking too much time i've got one more question is that okay do you want wait yes okay so working with the um explaining complaining um yeah well, i loved all of that in the fifth fetter and so i've been working with judgment a good bit with todd and um one thing i that i did because i can't i don't really fit judgment into the emotional indicators or those verbal indicators but i got to thinking about it, i thought well judgment's really like complaining and that you're something is a certain way and you're not really sure that you like it and that is what judgment actually is I thought, well it's in the complaining realm so i sort of really worked around with that would would that be a way to work with judgment or is there a better um framework it, it, yeah um judgment is both blaming shaming and complaining it's all of them it depends on on which type of judgment it is if it's the type of judgment where there's no solution it's just ongoing you know the weather you know it's like <laughs> ongoing 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 and there's no matter what anybody says you will have a new judgment about the same topic ready you know on hand then it's complaining if it's a judgment that is personal about another person it's in the shaming realm mm -hmm. and it's back to here okay if, it, if it's about an action a judgment about another person's action then it's the blaming Ram, which is about mm -hmm. the action and again right back here okay okay good so slow down zoom in and find out where does the judgment lie and who is it that believes that there's a parallel universe where where lisa is right this is happening and this is where the judgment is happening but if this was happening what i'm judging if this was happening instead i mean everybody would be happy well, the, the, look, the biggest look at, yeah look yeah. at those look at those two you know different going timelines that you are having in your mind right right well and, and one thing that seems fairly common is that there isn't an idea that lisa thinks that it that should it should be different because as soon as it's realized that judging is occurring there's a, a recrimination towards lisa for that really mm. That, then look into that why is lisa then judged for judging mm -hmm. that's the real meat right there in my situation oh yeah, yeah that's it's like it's like a weakness or something it's like oh my god that again you know it's really whew. it's it, it's funny we we talked about now we just had lunch and we talked about it uh todd he's um writing on on book at the moment and mm -hmm. where we talked about that part where when we have seen through self, we believe that we've seen through self, period, new chapter. So why am I back here now? I shouldn't, I shouldn't look at it like that. I have seen through self as if, you know, what is happening right now can't be true, can't be right. Because in the past, I saw through self. It's like, it's because we believe in that linearity that is not there. There's a new level ready for you to see through with the identification that you have of Elisa. First, you realize all the things that you realized, then you realize that you are judging. Now you're realizing that you're judging, that you're judging. So <laughs> it's, just, it's just a deeper level of identification that is happening. And who is who is judging you? Who is that judge of the judge? It's just the thinker that is a thought too. His thoughts, exactly. I mean, that becomes so apparent. It's like this hall of mirrors of judging judging the deeper you go you just keep seeing all these reflections and it's like at one point i think i wrote to todd it feels like one of those disco balls covered with mirrors that's just fucking wobbling all over the place to drive you crazy in a way it's like ah, it's all thought it's all delusional it's so it feels clear 
that that's what it is, but that doesn't knowing or see, thinking I know that doesn't change anything because that's another thought too. Yes, it's it's really it's really about you know slowing down. I'm, I'm when you talk with Todd about it, then you know look into the the judge of the judging and really dive into that one mm -hmm. until sure. you, until you have the one to one with him. Then see if you can kind of like zoom out and look at it from above. So there's no opinion or you're the anthropologist looking at the situation and seeing what is it that is happening what is the message to you about the judging because we are in the judging in the second you know it's in the second degree so it's like there's really really something to you to pick up about judging that there's something that needs to be loved and held and looked at uh, yes because who would you be if you didn't judge anymore? What is it that you would miss out on if you didn't judge? <laughs> All that recrimination. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's something you would miss out on. There's something that you would never, ever have the opportunity to realize the moment you stop judging. The, the realization that is wrapped up in the, in the parcel with the judging around it. In the middle of that, there's a little seed. And that is the one that that you would never ever realize if you just let go of it, and that's why it's important to look into it. Hmm. Who would you be without all the judging? Just, it, I would. I feel like I just there would just be this delightfulness. So, what would you miss out on? What part of you wouldn't be heard? If you don't look into the judging, there's a message. There's a story. That keeps... the, one that I... <laughs> the one who thinks says she knows something. Ah, oh, that's a good one. That's a good that one. one. That one kind of comes back periodically. Oh, that, um, that's that's amazing. Question. That was the answer to the question when that just without any thought at all, when Angelo asks in some video or something like, um, just ask yourself the question of. You know, who is it that you take yourself to be? And I just never had heard that question before. It was so new. And I just, and within a second, I was like, oh, I think I'm somebody who knows. And I was like, whoa. I mean, it was like a fucking bomb went off in front of my face. Yeah. And that was really, really good. Really, really good. Really, really good. Look into that. That's really, really good. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're amazing, honey. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And likewise. Thank you. I love so much that you guys are this brave and just diving into it. It's so wonderful. So, so wonderful. Hello, Jeremy. How are you? Hello. You're the brave so man. Great. <laughs> uh, quick thank you and a quick question. Um, in a recent meeting, you had given me some uh, input on how to approach um, showing up when family members were looking for empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. um, it has been such an eye-opener how much I was judging and uh, being critical and trying to apply logic mm -hmm. and uh, dismiss problems yes yes and um yeah it's it's been great <laughs> it's do, been great do you, see, do you see the need for control in that yeah yep and so much of so much of that is just dissolved without much effort that's amazing that's been great yeah that's thank you so 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 may I just ask you into it? So so when when somebody had um oh no, give me an example instead. Um somebody had an issue and instead of you allowing them have having the issue, you wanted them to hear how brilliant Jeremy is in solving <laughs> the issue. <laughs> uh I, as an example, um my wife at the end of the day, maybe um, sharing some struggles that she had had either with the project at work or a 
a coworker. Um, not only, I'm just reminded now that one of the bigger issues is that I would, I would judge her response to it, um, and be critical of how she was behaving. So not only would I not like be there for her and like sharing this struggle, and I was even just piling on. Like not only was that not a problem, you were a problem. And I was just like exploding all of these things. And of course she doesn't <laughs> often want to hear any of that. And it was, uh, it, it, I wasn't, I wasn't helpful. I wasn't you what she there? was looking for. <laughs> I wasn't there. You weren't there. Isn't it right. crazy? Isn't it crazy? Instead of just being present in the moment, we have, we, we are so hell bent and telling the other person how we know that they were wrong, but we are right. And if they just listen to us, we they will see how right we are. And their life would be so much better. They don't have to be them. They can be exactly like <coughs> we know it's the, the best way. Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Love it. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, in one of your videos, you mentioned a rotting corpse meditation. Yeah. And I've looked for some, I, I appreciate guided meditations when I'm first starting yeah. uh, a, a different one. Uh, before I, um, I need the, I need some training wheels. Do you know of a guided one? No. Um, I just know the one that I did myself. Um, I can actually make that. I can make that for you. Uh, That'd be fantastic. Yeah, just write down so I remember. Awesome. Thank uh, it's, you. It's it's a lot of years ago that I did it. Um, and the way I. But for everybody listening, uh, the rotting corp me corpse meditation is is one where you it really comes with a lot of warnings <laughs> because um, you imagine that that you're sitting next to your corpse and you are observing how how the body slowly dissolves, how the the bacteria are becoming into maggots, are becoming into flies, and slowly how you become into the liquid and and basically being completely dissolved until there's just salt left and there's there's nothing left and not not even a little flower growing up nothing um and it's a really really powerful meditation that in a lot of love in a lot of buddhist directions um are being uh, warned about and not used and not recommended because it's when you are opening up the way that you are in meditation it really it plunges you straight into ego death and you need to be ready to do that so i think it would be a meditation that i would put put in the members area um so it's not available on youtube but would be exclusively for the members area um because i wouldn't like people to go into <laughs> psychotic breaks and stuff like that just by doing that so so i i can make one jeremy and put it in there Thank you very much. Yeah, sure, sure. And thank you for the suggestion. And then it's Lisa Jane. Hello, my friend. So good hey. to see you. Hello. Speaking of psychotic breaks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go on. Excited to hear. Yeah, the, the guy, I, I sent taught a message the other day saying enlightenment my ass this feels more like an exorcism <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. what is what's your take on kundalini i would rather that you say what what it is you want me to say about it before i say some things that you don't want to hear I, I I am I'm very much about opening opening for the energy that the that is in in the chakras. Um, I'm a I'm educated as an acupuncturist as well, and so I know about how the meridians work. I know how the nerves look. When we have a 
an acupuncture point in a meridian is where you have you have the nerves going down here and then the, that goes like under the skin it goes like a spike up that's where we put the needle in and you can you know regulate the energy flow in the different organs with just one needle it's it's very logical in many ways and that's why i really enjoy it um so in that sense and for that use i'm very much about creating the flow in the chakras um the way that i see the chakras are connected to organs so the the solar plexus chakra is connected to the adrenal glands the throat chakra is connected to the thyroid um the para is connected to the the gonoid the gonads um and to the end to to hormonal releases in those areas so i use it both um energetically but also endocrinolic and endocrinologically i don't know how to say that in english and uh, energetically what if it just blows without your control are you talking about just... the, the the energy that comes up on yeah because you i have, i don't know what you've spoken with todd about have you had lots of physical reactions with the with vomiting diarrhea and all of that oh yeah but i mean that's all with everything else i have going on who knows i just i was on the yoga mat this morning and and i keep kind of getting these uh downloads or just kind of these thoughts come up and I had this memory and it was of a year ago and I was doing a clinical trial and it was horrible. And it was kind of the, the culmination of all this PTSD. I got betrayed by my doctor. I got betrayed by Pfizer. Imagine that, you know, and it was just, I was in a bad situation and I found Scott Killaby and joined his little two week free thing. And I, I went to one of his meditations that he was doing and something happened and I hadn't had any energy in a long time. And it came from like the lower chakra areas and just kind of, I mean, I was just, it felt, I was just on fire and vibrating and I finished the meditation. I hit the Island, hiked for like five hours. But then when I went home, it got sketchy. Like, like I'd done some really bad drugs or something in it and it went and it got scary until I was calling people and I was up all night and then I had to go back to the trial the next day. And ever since then, this past year has just been insane with all this up and down stuff. And, you know, I've just been blaming it all on PTSD, but I get all kinds of weird little zings and shakes and uh, and not that it really makes much difference at this point, but <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or oh, there's so many things. Um, do you have a one-to-one uh, -one schedule with Todd? No, I don't have an income. Yeah. So it makes it difficult. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, it's because you're saying so many things that I'm, I, I, this is not a one-to-one -one and I don't want to unpack a lot of things that would take us three hours. Yeah. Um, the experience you had with, uh, with Scott Killaby and when you did the meditation and you kind of had that release of energy, um, there's nothing weird or anything in that that energy is blocked in the body and you can re uh, release that in lots of different ways. I enjoy doing where you're standing with a hip width. I did the exercise, I think in the first or the second Q and A I had, so you can look back in the videos and, uh, and I do the exercise. It's where you're standing with a hip width and then you have slightly bent knees and then you kind of pump your weight into the ground. Mm -hmm. And in that pumping, you release um the muscle tension and the fascia tension that you have in your legs and around your pelvic floor um and that release is releasing a lot of energy you get a lot of warmth in the body when you then have released all that if you then you know shake around where you let your arms just relax you know the yoga exercise where you just swing yeah. from side to side and your arms are just relaxed um then you release all up again up at the spine and you release all of the, the tension that is around the spine and the muscles that are connected to the spine uh, are relaxed in that um 
there are other exercises where you um, yoga exercises where you do any kind of cross exercises yeah now, all that stuff's just kind of coming naturally yeah without but, a whole lot of those, thought going into those, it yeah, Qigong those, releasing, and... those are releasing the energy that you call kundalini energy they're releasing energy that is locked in the body uh, around muscles and around fascia and around mm -hmm. you know yeah where energy is 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 piled up um when we have an energy release if we're not mindful about how we spend our energy we will go for a five hour hike and piss it all away and that will leave you depleted because it was not it was not a sustainable it was like winning the lottery and going out and spending all the money instead of of containing or recircling the energy so when you do the exercises and you have a surge of energy use it to recircle into the areas that need extra attention that if you have um operation happening in your breast put your hands on your breast or where your breasts were and then you just you know put the energy back into those areas if you have a tension in your thighs on your lower back Imagine that you are recircling the energy into the areas that are, are depleted. So whenever you have an energy surge, you recircle it. You don't piss it away. Yeah, and it's because I haven't had energy for so long. I just spring out, and then I know, and then I, I know, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> but but the energy is is tied up. You know, the all that surplus is tied up. It doesn't mean that that you have a surplus of energy suddenly coming it's just what is tied up that needs to be you know delivered out to the areas that that are depleted okay does that help mm -hmm. and another thing i just would like to unpack is the part about where you were let down by your doctor and by your medical industry. I'm so, so sorry that that happened. Um, unfortunately, it's not uniquely to you. It's a lot of people that have cancer are experiencing exactly that. That this is the brand new thing you're told. And then it turns out that because it's a brand new thing, the doctor get extra kickback and that is why it's recommended to you. Um, Unfortunately, that happens. Um, I'm so, really, really sorry that it happened to you. And I'm sorry that you feel let down by that. If it's of it any help at all. Over and over and over. And that's the problem. You know, I, it's to the point. I had to go to the ER this week. I got another one of those phone calls. You know, you're short of breath. We can hear it over the phone. You could have a clot. You're going to die. They brought in the kids. If you die, what, what about your chill? You know, the guilt, all the things that they do. You can't drive yourself. You could take out a family. And I got to the hospital and I couldn't, I, totally, I'm backwards agoraphobic. I couldn't go in. I had to take Klonopin. I could not go in. To, there was no way this time I could walk through the door. I could swim through a pool of great white sharks way easier than I could have walked through those doors. I'm just done. Yeah. I, Which... I, yeah. <laughs> my, my sister, uh, my sister is in chemo at the moment. Um, and very much, um, yeah. And she had a fever and was also told that because she's on chemo that she had to go to the hospital, but she's alone with three kids and the hospital is an hour and a half away and she had work in the morning and who was going to take the kids to. And so she was like, that's absolutely impossible. I can't go to the hospital. And then she needed to ensure the doctors that she knew that it was on her own risk and her own responsibility mm -hmm. and, and they didn't have any. And, and when I spoke with her, she was just like, who else has the responsibility for my kids? Who else have the responsibility for the choices I make about my life and my cancer treatment? And so I, I completely, I understand where you are more than you think. Um, I think it's really important to keep coming back to, to your direct experience, keep coming back to what you know to be true, not what you are scared of is true.
but what you know to be true right now. And even when you have that agoraphobia with the hospital and you just can't go in and you need heavily being heavily sedated in order to go in, take one moment at a time where you see that no matter what is happening in that moment, it's okay. It's okay to be agoraphobic. It's okay to be heavily sedated. It's Everything is okay. It's fine. It's just so crazy to me that there's nowhere scarier to me in the United States than the hospital and the medical system. <laughs> I'm terrified of it. And it's learned. It's not some I know. tweaky little phobia, you know. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, if it's at all possible for you to have a one to one with Todd where you can unpack all those things, um, I would warmly warmly recommend and if anybody who is listening would like to donate a one-to-one -one with Todd for Lisa then please get in touch with Todd and he will sort it out that's not only the guys that are sitting here it's for everybody who's watching this recording thanks yeah lots of love my love hey oh oh you're muted you're muted you're muted Okay. Oops. Hang on. Oh, um, Lisa, oh. Jane, no, Lisa Jane, you're muted. This, this really has nothing to do with any of this, but the Grateful Dead, listen to the working man's dead. Thank you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> what was it called? Working man's dead. I, I came late to the Grateful Dead too. So that was like my initial. Perfect. I will. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Much love. <laughs> then it is, I think, Janine, you were first, weren't you? Yeah, before I let you. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, hello. I, I've got a question, but it's a, a little bit of a path to get there. So, okay. um, so we have a greyhound. We adopted a greyhound. And um, she's wonderful. I think she's the uh, the guru of the household. And uh, I've ha we've had her for about a month. A month. And in the beginning, she was walking very nicely uh, when I would take her for walks. But at some point, she started doing what's called statuing, where she would not budge. And um, we would have to go back home. And uh, eventually, I was getting a little frustrated because I came from a very... Um, angry household, uh, a dictator-like father. And I vowed that I was not going to be that <laughs> for Julie. Um, and so I was allowing her to just basically do what she wanted to do, but it was very frustrating. So my husband found a video on uh, greyhounds in this phenomenon of statuing, and it was it was wonderful. So the, the two great pieces of advice is that dogs being pack animals um, are good with a beneficent dictator. And in fact, they don't feel safe with wishy-washy leadership. And I'm like, oh, and then they suggest the three C's are to be calm, to be confident and consistent. And so I'm like, oh, so this is like totally new for me because this is not, not modeled at all by my parents, but I was determined that Oh, so she's just, she's feeling unsafe. And so I'm to be a leader, but you know, not an angry one. <laughs> yeah. So, so I began to do the practice and to make her go, I would give a, a gentle tug on the leash and, and, you know, have the clear intention. This is, you know, what we're doing. And, and it, it's been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm so, I'm so grateful that like, cause I, I thought it would be a terrible mom and um and she's just that's just really beautiful so i'm very grateful um i, I just love her <laughs> it's unbelievable um so last night it was around uh nine o'clock i was or so and i was going to be heading to bed and my husband works second shift and doesn't get home until i don't know like 1 30 or, or something and i felt like she should go pee um before i go to bed 
that she was not <laughs> having any interest in coming down from the second floor and, and having a pee. And I got her our, her leash, so I was going to lead her, and she was still like, nah, I don't want to do it. And so I gave a tug on the leash, but apparently it was too much of a tug, and she had a, a cry. And oh, that was just, that was so awful. Um, she did get up and then follow me down. We went outside, but I felt like such a, a monster. And um, like I would never, ever want to, want to hurt her. Um, so I, ca I called Joseph and, um, you know, he was, he was reassuring. Um, and, and she was, she was fine. <laughs> but um, I, I was so upset. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't go there. So I, I distracted with, with some, something and just went to sleep. But this morning, um, when I got in my meditation, I, I was determined, okay, let's go into this, 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 this terrible feeling. Um, and so what came up was that, uh, a flood of, of images from growing up. There was a time when I was not nice to animals and my, my, the anger, of my father was transferred through me to animals and so underneath that is terrible terrible guilt and shame a blackness like I could never be forgiven so um um feeling this it's uh coming through is is almost like the body's wanting to vomit With, without the vomit it's like all this this contraction it's like in, in the belly and, and gasps and, and uh, just this whole crazy thing for, for half an hour or so. I'm getting to the question. And Julie still loves me. Yeah, she cool. still kisses me. And, um, and I, I, I was, uh, the, the Buddhist um, idea of beginningless greed, hatred, and ignorance, you know, came to mind. So it, it wasn't like it was anybody's, not mine, not my father's, not his parents. It's just like on and on. So I was holding that. I had an appointment today uh, with my physical therapist, who is actually some kind of somatic therapist. And there's always like emotional release stuff going on. And there's not always images. There's just... I, there's like 50 years of shit that is just com coming out now. Okay, now I'm getting to the question. So um, uh, last weekend, I believe it was, I was I was terribly triggered uh, by a, uh, an interaction with my sister via texting. And I was so furious that out of my mouth came, I hate her. I don't care if I ever see her again. She's like gone from my life. I saw beliefs like uh i'll never be good enough in her eyes in my eyes <laughs> um and there was the thought okay i need to go sit down and feel this um but i didn't i didn't do it um i was gonna have my husband join me and somehow it, it just never happened so i didn't feel it i tried to feel it the next day in in meditation and it just turned into an inquiry about what is hate what is anger and I did not get, you know, the same emotional release. It was just a bunch of thoughts. And so um, I'm aware of a belief that I don't know how to feel. Like I'm a very expressive, sensitive, emotional creature. And yet somehow I don't know how to feel. But like, that's not true, right? Because <laughs> oh, a lot of stuff has been. So um, I guess my question is, what is my question? Why couldn't I feel? Why couldn't I feel that 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 anger thing? Or, and do I just trust that it's just going to occur in well in time? I'm introducing time. I don't know. I'm a little confused. Okay, breathe. Okay. Wonderful. First of all, I love you. Breathe. Breathe. 
It's okay. It's okay. I keep wanting to say I'm sorry. Like I'm just. I know. I know. No. 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 <laughs> wait. 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 Because we are piling more on. What you're doing is diversion. You're okay. diverting and diverting and diverting. Okay. Everything you have said, I see it very, very clearly. I see it very clearly. The first thing that you really need to keep in mind is that that you are loved. You are loved. Even though it feels like you're very, very far away from that with the acknowledgement that you're beginning to come in with the insight that is coming up now. You know, it feels like you are the most horrendous, horrible person on the planet. And I understand that. I understand that. Please remind yourself that you are loved. Joseph loves you and Julie loves you. I love you. And I think everybody who is sitting here is very, very compassionate towards what is going on in your life right now. So just remind yourself of that. What you're going through right now seems like it's something that you did towards Julie. Breathe, 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 breathe. And if your body needs to shake, just shake. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. What we, what you are actually getting into is how it was to, for you to be a child and be vulnerable with a dad like you, like your dad. Breathe, 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 breathe. It's okay. Shake your body. Could you stim your hands, please? Let go of your hands. Stim your hands. Good, 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 good. It's okay. It's okay. Stim your hands. Stim, stim, stim. It's okay. It's okay. You're beginning to get an insight. Very, very undiluted how it was to be a child of your dad. <sighs> breathe, breathe, breathe. The feeling that you have that you can hardly be in your body. <laughs> Stay with that. And if you need to divert, stim your hands. Just stim your hands. It doesn't need to be locked into your body. You can stim your hands. It's okay. It's okay. All of that shaking that is happening, all of that contraction, that is tension that is tied up in your body regarding your childhood and your dad. So just let go of it. Whatever crying you need to do, you don't need to have clear pictures. You don't need to know what it's about. You don't need to control any of the shaking that is happening, any of the contractions. Just allow all of it to be released. It's here now because we talk about it. So just allow it to be there and allow the body to release whatever needs to be released. It's okay. Breathe. The gasping of air that you feel, it, that is very, very early. So just keep breathing. It's okay. You don't have to hold hold crying back. You can cry here. It's fine. It's fine. 
it's tied up experiences it's experiences that the body went through that has been hidden away and been tied up and now talking about it it come it just surfaces and it's okay for it to surface you're completely safe it's just tied up energy in the body and tied up experiences in the body and you can just completely allow all of it to be there it's fine it was there all along. There's nothing extra happening. It's just surfacing. It's fine. Okay, deep breath. Do you see the similarities between Julie and you as a child? Yeah. Do you see, do you see the projection you made into Julie, where you projected you as a child being defenseless, being forced. Do you see the projection that you did when you were younger in your life? And you had all of this hidden away in your body. And the only way to get it out was to be violent towards somebody that was as helpless as you felt. Breathe, breathe. But that's unacceptable. <laughs> really? Really? Are you sure about that? It's you were you were you were a child, you were younger, right? You didn't have the the emotional maturity and intellectual maturity that you do now, psychological maturity that you do now. You were in a position where you had been victimized over years and in order to survive you mm -hmm. let that out in the same way so you made somebody feel the way that you felt oh. <laughs> it's a survival oh. <laughs> it's a survival It was the tools you had available. You can't judge that. It was the tools you had available. If if you had a tool available with um, an amazing counselor, with an amazing therapist, with an amazing teacher, with an amazing parental guidance, if you had had that tool, you would have spoken to the person and you would have used that tool. That tool wasn't available. You used the only tool that you had to survive to get all of that out of your body somehow. And that was projecting your helplessness into somebody else being as cruel to them as he was to you. That was a survival and it's okay. <laughs> you cannot judge the person you were when you were cruel to the animals. It was a way of surviving. It was the only tool you had available. If another tool had been there, you would have chosen another tool. That was chosen because it was what was available. You cannot judge that. You can only have compassion with that. 
Can you zoom out a bit? Zoom out. As an anthropologist, look at the genome that needs to project all that helplessness and anger onto another helpless being. Can you have compassion with her? Mm. Can you see how loved she is from the from the uh, from the point of view that you and I have now, looking back at it? Can you see how loved she is? She was really, really trying to make the best of it. That was the tool that was available. Can you find forgiveness for that? We're not condoning, we're forgiving. We are understanding, we're not condoning, we are understanding. And with lots of compassion, we understand it. The love that I, the love that I feel for this Julie, I like to direct that way to the little versions. Yes. Yes. It's easier with Julie. Yeah. Then do it that way. If you can see you in her. It helps no one. This is to everyone that's listening. It helps no one to judge ourselves for things we have done previously in our lives. Those were the tools available and those were the choices we made with the tools available. If we had had other tools, we would have done differently. We didn't. So it's not condoning. It's truly understanding with lots of compassion, understanding. The next step, which I'm a bit reluctant to say it. I just want to say it for anybody who's working with this on, on their own. The next step is obviously to do the same with your dad. I thought that I, that I have, I don't know, that's just a bunch of intellectual bypassing i thought i really did forgive him because it's like not this whatever this is it, it's not his it's not mine i don't know I mean, certainly willing i i understand that he uh everybody is is operating from a certain level of awareness and they can't do any better. So how can you like condemn anybody for doing their best? That's a belief. I know. So it's good. Well done in seeing through that one. It is a belief. And and that is why this this starts to get really, really complicated because it's easier to forgive if we have that belief that everybody did the best. But that's a belief. You need so to let you, that belief as well. So, so how do you? All right. How do you do it without that? You know. We have that because we need to make meaning of something that we don't that we can't make any meaning with. So when you let go of that, you also let go of the meaning. There's so many things in life that are completely meaningless. And it's really, really difficult to accept that. What I talked with Glenda about in the beginning, that it's easier. You know, if you view the universe as there's a higher purpose, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and there's meaning with all of it. Life is easier that way. And it's okay to have those training wheels on for as long as you need them. You don't need to let go of it. You can keep the training wheels on as long as you need them. 
at some point you will see that there is no meaning. The meaning is a belief. And in that lies a lot of freedom and a lot of forgiveness <laughs> and a lot of love. But we can use every experience we have had. It's not when we say that there's no meaning in it, it doesn't mean that it can't be used, that it can't be useful. Things can be useful, experiences can be useful without there being a meaning in it. A thing can be useful, a childhood can be useful without needing the meaning for any bigger, you know, interwoven, you know, divinity. But it's just, you know, shit happens and then we die. And without that being nihilistic in any way. <laughs> and then I also want to say, just last thing I want to say, that Julie is so fortunate. Really, really is. I'm looking forward to hearing the next chapter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for holding space. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you. And then it's Anna. Hello, my friend. Hello, Pernil. <clears throat> I just want to say um, what Janine was talking about, it's really resonated because I had a very similar experience. I was beaten up and then I was beating up my younger sister and I was beating up the shit out of my dog as well. Yeah. And I was like, when I was a kid, it was very cruel. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then um, <sighs> I was beating up my kids as well. Yeah. A lot has been going on this week. I just feel so much pressure. I'm just like overwhelmed. And every time I feel like overwhelmed, I feel like I'm going to break down. And then I feel resistance. Like I don't want anything yeah. anymore. I'm just, I was, <clears throat> before I finish of work today, I was driving home and I just really could feel that resistance because my boss was, you know, like, keep going, keep going, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I missed a couple emails and I just, you know, like, I'm like, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling. And uh, and then there was like an ongoing issue with one client. Four days, you're emailing back and forth and I was accused of making mistakes and there was no my errors because I've been double checking everything what I'm doing. Eventually, you know, like, she didn't look on the right thing and that's where that mistake was. And, uh, and then, you know, like I remember the first day I was just driving home and just like, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're useless, you're feeling. <laughs> and, and then uh, another day, my daughter, she rang me and she felt very overwhelmed because she applied for a new job and she can't get references. And as I say, if she's not sending all reference, all paperwork by Friday, they go on to take her application and she's not getting that job. So I said to her, you know, like, if this job is meant to be for you, you will be there. If that's not meant to be, that's just not, that's not you know, that's, don't, don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself. And uh, like you have a roof over your head, you have a job, you have money, you have to eat, you know, like there is nothing to worry and you will get a job like if you want something different. But at the same time, you, you don't know. And then so that was sort of then she just before she started to talk to me, she had like incident at work. So it was a one her co-worker wasn't nice to her. So we discussed that. And uh, it was weekend past with her birthday and her dad it didn't like she didn't see her dad not like didn't see but we separated when she was a kid like eight something around that age anyway dad 
like her picture on Facebook, but he didn't say happy birthday to her. And I know like he doesn't care about me. And if he like it's only two words. And I say the like, kitty, but you don't know what's going on, you know, like with him, why he did that. And I see how much it's hurting her. And I see she's making that story. He doesn't care me. He doesn't love me. That's what he's doing. And I'm trying, you know, like to, to you know, that's that's what you know, like I said, like how, how does it make you feel? confused and like i can see that anger is coming out she's basically screaming her peeing out and you know like confused but i see she's hurting i say like it's like, like you know i think i said something you know is it, is it hurting you what do you want mommy what do you want i told you you asked me i told you and i can see that's you know like emotional is raising in myself as well and i'm getting agitated so i'm trying to settle down like, why can't you have normal conversations? Why you can't be just normal mom? And like, why you, every time you need to unpack me? I don't need a psychotherapy session and things like this. And I was like, why you can't just have a normal conversation? I said, okay, let's have a normal conversation. What do you want to talk about? That's lunchtime. Let's talk about lunch. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, you know, this and that, like something about mom. I said, yes, you know, like, you're right. You're right. What are you doing? And like, you know, more. I'm agreeing with her, like more anger is causing it in, in her. Anyway, like she said something like, if you don't want to see me as your daughter anymore, don't want to see me in your life. And then she just hung up. In the meanwhile, my son came because he finished school earlier and he was expecting me to take him home in the car. He had to take a bus. He started to throw tantrums. I was just like, ah. <laughs> and then I'm just like I'm just feeling like I'm all shaky I'm just all shaky I'm just like I don't know I just like so much and I feel like people having expectations on me and I'm having expectations on myself you know like um like I see how people are trying to box me you know like you have to be this way for me you have to be this way for me you have to be this way for me and everyone expecting me to make them happy but I'm not here to make people happy <laughs> and then I was talking to my boyfriend about setting boundaries and things like that and I said you know like if because my daughter she keeps bringing past every time we have a conversation she brings past Mommy, do you remember when I was a child? Mommy, do you remember when I was a child? And she's comparing herself, like she's 26, my youngest is 13. Mommy, do you remember when I was 13? I did that. And mommy, mommy, remembers this and remembers that. And she like passively, aggressively snapping and like throwing, throwing them. You know, like she's like, she's hurting and she wants to hurt me this way. Yes. And I'm, you know, like, I'm really like, I said like, why are you doing this? And then something else she said, like, um, I'm pretty calm person, you know, pretty chilled. I said, like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, I am also. You are? Do you remember what you did then? Do you remember this and that? I said, like, Kitty, but you don't know me. I know you very well. I said, Kitty, I don't know myself. <laughs> and things like that. Uh, so I thought, you know, I need to talk to her and just have this, you know, let's talk about past and just close it. Because it's a new point. Not to happening. Bring Not happening. Um, Not happening. You can't, you can't do that. I'm so sorry, Anna. I, I'm I'm so sorry. You can't you can't do that. That would be the cruelest thing to do, you know, because then you're making you right now. You're making her issues into you. You're you're Jeremy right now. You're Jeremy. What Jeremy was talking about earlier, that's you. It's what you're trying to do. You know, I know what my daughter needs. I need for her to talk calmly about the past all the things that I did wrong because it's so uncomfortable in my body to be with so I don't want to visit that again so now we're going to talk about it we're going to close it and she's never going to bring that up again and I'm never going to be uncomfortable again and then she will be happy no she will not be happy she will not be happy no 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 <laughs> but don't bring it to me yeah <laughs> Yeah. deal with your own shit i have plenty on my own plate to deal with. <laughs> uh, yeah it's it, it's i mean yeah Con welcome to motherhood congratulations <laughs> it's all i can say you have kids i mean if anybody want to work with themselves get a family it's <laughs> it's one of the things you know and 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 the thing with kids is like you say your daughter is 26 you know she has 20 at least 23 years of experiences that she can throw in your face and the person you were 23 years ago was the person that was making a shitload of mistakes 
you know mm-hmm. you have mm-hmm. scarred her you have scarred her for life uh, a lot and i yeah. know that all yeah. my three yeah. kids i know that you be in a body where you have scarred another person for life mm-hmm. that's the question can you allow her to be in pain can you be in a body where you have scarred her for life yeah, that's hurting me yeah it's hurting you and that's why she should shut up because it it's hurting you what you did can you be in a body where you made all those mistakes? She's allowed to be, you know, in a lot of pain. She's allowed to hate you forever. She's allowed to ghost you forever. Never, ever speak with you again and create a story about who she sees you as. So she doesn't need to look into the pain. She's allowed to do that. Can you live with that? Can you be in a world? <laughs> Half the new option. <laughs> exactly. Half the exactly. 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 She needs to know that you love her. She needs for you to honestly apologize. Just like if you if you think back on your parents, you have had also had a very violent childhood. You need to be able to look at your parents and and, and you can feel in your body that What would really, really help is for them to become awake. Your parents, right? Become awake. It's it's impossible. (laughs) Yeah, I know, I know. But let's 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 just. It's not even alive anymore. (laughs) Let's just imagine. Let's just imagine. Your parents become awake, and they call you and they say, "Anna, I love you so much. I'm so so sorry. I know what I did to you. I regret." every moment of it i'm so sorry that i did not give you the life you were deserved the childhood that you deserved i'm so sorry that would in you release a lot of anger a lot of hurt a lot of pain a lot of hatred right your daughter needs that the only way you can stop this trend in your family is to do what you really, really would like your family to, your your parents to do to you. She is in pain. She keeps bringing the past up because it needs to be brought up. You need to shut up and listen and apologize. I have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody who has a problem with this, raise your hands. I have a problem with apology <laughs> because I don't feel I have done anything wrong. I know, I know, but clearly you have. <laughs> In her eyes, <laughs> because if I if I feel I have done something wrong, I mean I have to blame my mom and dad. They've done something wrong, but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. They obviously didn't, and I know that. And I didn't do anything wrong. No, <laughs> so I you know, like I don't feel guilty. But but Anna, we're not talking about you, are we? We're talking about your daughter. <laughs> I know, I know, and everything you did, just like just like we talked with Janine, right? Everything she did when she was cruel to the animals, she did from the from the backpack, from from the availability of surplus that she had at that point. There's there's no judging. Nobody can judge that. But your daughter is not in a place to see that yet. Mm. You You Mm -hmm. are. You are. And you can view Anna through your daughter's eyes and see. I see your pain. I see that I could have done better. I love you. I'm so sorry. How can I help you? Because this is not about you. It's about your daughter's pain. Can you be in a body where your daughter absolutely hate you and hold everything against you? Can you be with that where you don't have to defend it and you don't have to make yourself look good and you don't need to do a little, you know, campaign about motherhood or anything. You can just shut the fuck up and be there for your daughter. You know, um, I think this I'm is not saying, not... Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying that she's right because she can't be. You're not right either because you can't be. None of you remember what really happened. You only remember the stories of what happened. And those are very, very subjective. This I think. What is the worst thing with all this? It's not as much as it's hurting me to see her pain. This, 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 yes. But I think like 
deeper lower down behind that there is this self-hatred yeah. of self-abandonment i'm not being able to defend myself I'm small and I'm helpless and I'm powerless. I can't stand up for myself. I can't yes. defend myself. Yes. And every time she hates me, it brings that, you know, like, I fucking hate myself. Yeah. And that's the problem. As long as you agree with her, you would have to defend yourself. So I would recommend you to reach out to somebody here in this group that you feel comfortable with and ask if you can, you know, ping pong with them about it whenever whenever there, something has happened with your daughter that you need to ping pong about to heal you about it. So you have the surplus when you're speaking with her and you can stay grounded in you and feel that I'm okay, everything is fine. Whatever she brings to the table, it's fine. There's not a mirror in you going like, well, Anna, she, she you know, I am hating Anna. I completely get what she's talking about. I don't want that and, you know, you need you need somebody to to talk to who can hold the mirror up in front of you and going like do you want to do you want to talk about this do you want to look about this because until you can be in a body where this is happening you will deflect from your daughter there was one case recently i was driving and someone was behind me with very strong lights and that really you know like blinded me it was dark and you know in the mirrors so I kind of leaned forward because it's only thing I could do pull aside or just you know like lean forward so and I slowed down uh, one thing I slowed down because it was you know like it's hard to drive in that condition but another thing what I have noticed what was coming up you know that nastiness like because I like <laughs> I knew I assumed they're annoyed <laughs> Yeah. Because they were really sitting in the back and really trying to get over, but they couldn't. And I, you know, I assumed that's annoying me and that nastiness, because that's the only thing I could, you know, they 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 are they are annoying me. So this is the only thing I can do to annoy them. And I actually enjoyed that. I enjoyed that being nasty and doing something bad. To <laughs> and then I came back and I reflected that and I, you know, like I could see there is that self-hatred. Yes, because I abandoned myself. I feel so small and powerless and helpless and I couldn't do anything to them. So yes. at least something nasty I can do to them. Yes. I love that. I love that you see that so clearly. And I love your honesty in bringing this to the table because I think everybody here recognizes that, you know, when we do something where we know we're nasty, but we enjoy it. That's super, super amazing insight to have. And know that, you only do that because there's something in you that needs to be healed. There's something in you that needs to be loved and held compassion for and held space for and be looked at with kindness. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the need to be nasty towards anyone else. And, and when we go into that, but I have seen through self, I'm awake, I'm always a beautiful person, then we're, we're completely deluding ourselves. Absolute bullshit. I call bullshit. Yeah, absolutely. But but doing what you're doing with that level of honesty, then you can actually get to the root of it. You can actually, okay, right now I'm driving, they're doing something, I feel threatened, I'm reacting. Okay, can I be in a body where I feel this reaction? What would be the kind solution right now to me and to the person behind me? It would be pull aside and let them pass. And and that's let it. Them exactly, exactly. And the whole issue is solved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you know, like say doing something to me, I'm going to do something to them. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, exactly. I, I really, uh, really love that, that you're that honest when you look at it. But I think that this is one thing I remember came up to me, you know, I don't know how this honesty raised up first at all, but another thing, like without being honest, because I could see sometimes, you know, like I was thinking about mom, I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's bullshit. And you can really see that, you know, mind is trying to do this, just not to look there. So I think without being like brutally honest with yourself, it's impossible. Right. Exactly. And go back to the body. The mind is playing tricks on you. You you haven't got a single memory from your childhood that's true. You only have stories about it. 
So the only thing you can do is go back into the body. So how does it actually feel right now? When I sit with memories about my family, my, about my childhood, release the memories and just sit with how it feels in the body because how the body perceived it at the moment, that is where all the scouring is. And that is what needs space. It's also where all the identification is, you know, that we attach an identity into this, that contraction that we have in the body. So releasing all the thoughts and just sitting with that contraction in the body and allowing that to be there, it's actually where, where freedom lies. But you need to be brave to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'd really love that you're going that that way, that you are that brave. Um, I was okay until this week. And I can see, like, mind, like, really, it's just, like, chat 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 and it's like all attention is here i was doing so well last couple of months keeping attention in the body this week is just like something like switched off and i'm trying and next thing it's just back here again yes. and uh, like nothing like you know any reminders anything nothing works it's just like here here all the time yes it's because that the, you're you're past the honeymoon period now it's beginning, now we're beginning to work with the real stuff. And the real stuff is that I had a I have a full list of things I could sit and talk with you for three hours about all this. Can I make official complaint? I never got the honeymoon period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there we go. <laughs> yeah. Just hard work. <laughs> um, it's all all this emotional start to come up come up in uh, 2019-20. And it was very, very like uh, like big, intense layers were coming up. I was working with attachment style theory, you know, through um like fearful avoid avoidant attachment style. I had brought up a lot of beliefs and all this. Then it kind of settled down, and now there's like more subtle layers are coming up. Yes. So if you if you take the attachment styles right, and you feel into into the attachment style that you identify with and then you feel how it feels in the body and then you release the thoughts about it and just stay with how it how the sensory experience is then it's super super useful that's unsafe it's unsafe the world is dangerous place people are dangerous you know like you can't trust anyone or anything it's just danger 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 and safety and safety just be on alert all the time just watch 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 and just yeah. like yeah and that has been that has been your survival mechanism. But right now, in your direct experience, what is danger right now? That's yeah, yeah. None. There's none. You cannot find a single thing in this moment right now that no. is a danger. Even when you're sitting with your daughter and she's talking, in this moment right now, there's no danger. It's only the thoughts that you attach to the conversation that is danger. In in reality, there's no danger. Driving with the person behind you that is really, really pushing in that moment is a danger. Even standing in an alley with a person holding a gun to your head in that moment, there's no danger. It's the thoughts about it mm -hmm. that is danger. And the thought, yeah, exactly. And the thoughts is what you what you can really look into. First of all, look into what are they pointing to? What is it that they want you to look at? And then release them. I have noticed this one day uh, after watching, um, oh, what is another German lady works with feathers? I forgot her name. Christian. Yeah. Yeah. When she had this, um, her healing video, when she worked with Dan, I think his name, and um that's actually it was like i picked a few things and i remember i was driving one day to work and can see that tension coming in you know like and there's nothing really is happening i just like there's nothing is happening here and mine just yes but you know high speed and anything can happen so, but you are safe now and safe now and safe now and safe now and next thing released <laughs> because it's just like something can happen something can happen last night i woke up and it was just body was so peaceful like mind was so quiet and next thing it's too good to be true yeah yeah <laughs> for the other shoe to drop yes yes it's like all the time expecting something bad to happen if yeah. you're happy 
No, 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 no. Don't get overexcited. Something bad is going to happen. Don't be happy. Yeah. It's just like this, just, you know, keeping you on alert all the time. Yeah. And then I, I would like for you to look into that magical thinking that you clearly had as a child, because you have the magical thing and you're sitting and talking about now that you can, if you are happy, then you will be punished. So therefore, by not being happy, you won't be punished. That is magical thinking. That is a survival mechanism of a child. So see when you're in the situation and you have that magical thinking happening, if you can, if you with compassion can be with that going like, okay, my love, I got your back. Let's look at this. And then you look at it and then what you do exactly what you're doing in this moment right now, what is dangerous. And if you, the more you practice that you have your back, no matter what, no matter what can happen and you still have your back. That's, that's tr trust. Yes. Yeah. Um, say for example, like that day when I was driving and I just, you know, like I'm useless and failing and stupid and all this. Yeah. And um, so what is the best to do? You know, like intentionally to go on like this to bring that pain up because I see this is happening, not like some thoughts are coming up, and then I intentionally start to do that to raise it up, you know, just to feel it. Or yeah. You know, well, or yeah. do self affirmation. No, like I'm, I, oh. I love you, and you're so good, and all this. Which one? <laughs> that that's uh, yeah, I love that, and it's it's super bypassing. I would look into, <coughs> sorry, I would look into, what does it mean to be stupid and useless? You're wrong. You're wrong, and you know, like no one is going to. That's fear of rejection because yeah. you're stupid. You're useless. We too don't quick. want you. Go away. We don't need you. You're too quick. You're too quick. You're too quick. Slow down, slow down. What does it mean to be stupid and useless? People will be angry with me. Okay. And how does that feel in the body? Because now you're not talking about stupid and, and useless. Now you're talking about the second label, which is people will be angry at me. Back to the first label, stupid and useless. What does it mean to be stupid and useless? You actually shouldn't be here. Okay, that's the second. You, you're not. You're not worthy to be in, in in on the planet. That is the second label, that you shouldn't be here. That is a thought and a thought. Do Do you see where I'm pointing? You're moving away from what you. What my question is. My question is, what does it mean to be stupid and useless? So far, you're putting an extra label on stupid and useless. It's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you to look into what does it mean to be stupid and useless? Not a, an interpretation of stupid and useless, but to be stupid and, and useless. You mean what? like feeling in the body? Yeah. Like no, nothing is coming up. And normally, you know, like when that is there, that's, I can feel, and that's normally here. Okay, what I would like for you to notice is that that what you are feeling it's not stupid and useless. No, it's, it's not. It's the Completely. it's all the labels you attach to stupid and useless, and then that, that is about people abandoning me. That's about me being vulnerable. That's about. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the label stupid and useless. Period. Nothing more. Nothing more. Can you be in a body where you're stupid and useless? Nothing more. Just that's stupid and useless. And can you see that it's completely okay to be stupid and useless? There's nothing more attached to it. So when you get a thought, you're so stupid and useless, you can go like, <laughs> I know, I know, I know it is. Yeah, is that exactly, that's exactly what I've done. And that's so much came up here at that moment when I agreed with that. But not then, you resist go, it. then you look into what is this about? Because this is not about stupid and useless. We just found out that stupid and useless is fine. Okay. So it's something else. What is that? It's about people abandoning me. Okay. What is it about being abandoned? Then no you look into that. Me. What is that? No How? one wants me. Everyone that, hates that, me. That, Everyone that, hates that, me. Stop, stop, stop. You're too quick. Now, that were three labels you just added on to being abandoned. 
we can deal with those afterwards. Right now you're sitting with the sensation in your body of being abandoned. How does that feel? Not all the other labels you're adding to people hate me, I won't have no one. That is other labels. We can deal with them in a moment. The only label we're dealing with right now is being abandoned. How does it feel to be in a body where you're being abandoned? And if you if it's not okay, then you have just attached another label to it and you're blind. No, it's very okay because it's just like That's, more on this side, but it's nothing it, much. Abandonment is completely fine. I can be in a body that's abandoned. Okay. Then there was, a, you had three other labels. You can write them down because it goes so quick that we forget, right? So you can write them down and then you take the next label. Okay. Just that label on its own. How does it be that I'm going to be all alone and be eaten by cats? Okay. Let's take the first one. We're going to be all alone. How does it feel to be in a body where I'm all alone? And lots of thoughts are coming up. Those are extra labels. Wait with that. Write them down if you want to. All alone. On its own. Sense, sense that they start to come up. Yeah, and then you write that down. And then mm -hmm. until it's completely fine with being all alone. Okay. Everybody where you're all alone. Not all the labels added, added to it. Not the post-it on the post-it on the post-it on the post-it. You can deal with those in a moment. One post-it at a time. So I take I take posters <laughs> right down there you go. and then just work with one individual. <laughs> there you go. So, no. so, so, so you take one poster at a time and really, really feel into it. Not to all the posters because write it down on other posters and deal with those afterwards. One poster at a time. And so far you have found out it's okay to be stupid and useless. It's okay to be all alone. It's okay to be abandoned. All of those being in the body where that thought is, I am abandoned. It just hangs there. There's there's nothing. There's nothing. Because it's just an empty thought that means nothing. And that empty thought is not connected to anything. It's just a thought. Like, the sky is green. It means nothing. It means nothing. And by that, you can be, you can go into, the, obviously, if you want to go into the room where you feel all alone and you sob about your loneliness and all of that, you can do that as well. If that is needed, do that. By all means, do that. I, what I want you to reach is the point where every single room of the house is fine. And when your daughter says, you were never there for me, you abandoned me. You left me alone. You can say, sweetheart, I love you. I'm so, so sorry. Because you've something been... resistant. Once you say that, something resistant. Then write it down. Write it down and sit That's with... That's exactly this. I am so, so sorry. Just resistance. Instantly. Yeah. Yeah. Look into There is that. something with that. Is this apology and sorry. Is there something just like, no, 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 okay. no. Normally, I, normally I'm, I'm going to give you like a, the, a cheat sheet to that one. When we don't want to apologize to people for something that they think we have done and we don't feel it's right to do it, it's normally because we think that life is a zero-sum game. It means that if I apologize to you, I'm never going to get my apology. Oh. So look into that. Just because you're apologizing to her... Oh, not because me. I'm giving to her, so I'm empty here and no one is going to give me. Yes. Yes. Yes, because I have something, and if I give it away, that's it, that's gone, and I can't get anymore. Yes. Not enough again. Yes. Okay. Oh, my mind is so quick. <laughs> yes. I love your mind. <laughs> I love I you. Normally have, before before I open my eyes, before body wake, this here, 100 so, thoughts, 100 miles per hour. I normally wake up and I just say to my boy, you know what I just thought? When did you think that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and people say you know like before before first thing in the morning before you wake up before you open your mind and before you open your eyes see the first thought is coming it's impossible it's like they are running running yeah not not with this here 
but but start start to look into that you know start to like like we just talked about start to look into that and then let me know next time slow down slow down slow down thanks very much Bernal. Thank, thank you, you so thank you so much thank you thank you sophie hello 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 i have a question um concerning the bubble of reality yes and the things uh, saying about other people yes so is it always that uh, if we say something about others that it always has to do something with us yes so is it also if for example sebastian asked me um what do you think like kind of how i feel yeah and i say i have the feeling that you feel agitated or nervous or whatever mm -hmm. is it that i'm agitated <laughs> you perceive him as agitated because there's something in you that gives you that thought why did why did you get that thought what was it what was it that gave you that idea um the the behavior that kind of he had so how did that make you feel the behavior that he had did you feel agitated by the his behavior not, not really i felt more uh I don't understand, well, I can just see that he's agitated, but maybe I felt in the sense of agitated, something is not right, or what can be right, uh, what can be wrong, uh, is there anything he needs, or whatever, in that sense. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, you can only ever, empathy is when we feel the other person in us, as us. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. So, so when you feel that he's agitated, it's his behavior that is agitating you mm -hmm. and you feel agitation, which could be a mirror to him that he needs to look, he's agitated, but mm -hmm. it's you who's seeing it. It's you who's mm -hmm. seeing it. So you also need to look into your agitation. Mm -hmm. And if it's about um, like other people, like we have a friend and he keeps, keeps telling like the same pattern it's a different story but it's a pattern so we kind of talk about the pattern and then it's like okay is it uh how we see the world or is it like really what is concerning to him and it felt appears like oh what what can i think and <laughs> what but can i not think and can i ever advise um no you can never no you can never give any advice to anyone you can no. only ever get a, give advice to yourself but, hmm. but it be very, very clear that what I'm doing with the Q&A is hmm. when you guys say something, you are reminding me of something in me hmm. that I'm that I'm saying. That's why it's so useful that when Todd is here, because he's mm -hmm. saying something different. So on the hmm. Q&A, on the inquiry that we have on Tuesdays, you have two different hmm. aspects. But make no mistake, I'm talking from the viewpoint of my backpack. I can't talk about anything else. Todd is talking mm. from the viewpoint of his backpack and that is the usefulness in it. And as, mm. long as, as long as Todd and I are humble regarding that and knowing that whatever I see is true is just my truth and truth mm. to me, then I have no need for you to do anything. You can do whatever you want with our conversation. If it's useful, I'm really happy. If it's not useful, I'm really happy. Got nothing to do with that. So when you look mm -hmm. at the friend and you see that the, your friend has a pattern, make no mistake, it's your pattern recognition that is seeing that. If you, if you come from a space where you have no hooks into your friend doing anything specific, then you can be at a, at the at the fifth floor advent point where you can you can see what is happening in the maze that he's running around in and, mm -hmm. and you have no need for him to see the way out of the maze he can be in the maze as long as he wants to and you can see the benefit of him being in the maze and you can see the benefit of him not being in the maze 
but he is free to do what he wants to do. Then you are at a really, really good place to give him advice. Mm. But you're also in a position to see that if he does not take your advice, that is equally okay. Because who are you to know what he can use the advice to? Okay, but there's nothing wrong or it's not like a false identification if this if it's coming out of this place. If it if it's is it... out of a place where you know that if he did what you want him to do, then his life would, would be better, then we're back to what Jeremy talked about. But it's not like uh like that. It's more like um uh, not being judgmental, just like seeing it and uh, maybe talking about it and uh like more in, in the sense of making offers like could it be this and that and not like oh you should do this and then you would be happy mm. but um it was just like the question coming up can can it ever be uh like neutral or ever not coming out of the place uh which is not my reality it can only so, come out of your reality yeah because you haven't got any that there's there's no there's no one in there that is uniquely knowing everything. Mm -hmm. you, know? you only know the things you know, the things you have experienced. You can only recommend out from your experience. If you have no uh, experience, if he's going to Turkey and he's not sure you've never been to Turkey and he's not sure if he should, you know, bring roller skates then you can only recommend him on how it was for you to roller skate in Spain if you've been to Spain and roller skated there. You cannot recommend him. So mm -hmm. you would take a starting in your mind, even before you become aware of what is happening, you will have a mental picture of you roller skating in Spain. And that would be the starting point of your advice to him about bringing roller skates to Turkey. Mm. That was such a bad example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Sorry. Can I just? <laughs> I, can I? Can I just bring the thing up? Because like, what what he is basically saying is that if he would have a partner like Sophie that is into the same stuff, into yoga, surfing, spirituality, then he he would be happy, whole. Mm. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Whole. Maybe yeah. it's a little bit dead, and then he sees in every potential girl he meets that partner and from the beginning is only looking at if she could be the one and I guess you, you are absolutely right in saying because I have done that in the past for sure and I can really see that like I can see my I, I try to say old reality in it because I feel like this is not the same anymore with Sophie but he sees us that way. He sees us as the perfect example of how yeah. it should be in his life. And we can mm -hmm. kind of, I feel like we can, like Sophie yeah. said, yeah. we can see the, the prison in that. Like, yeah. And it's like an if, and it's like, a, it's, a, it's a kind of suffering. And uh, he's like always bringing this topic up first when we meet, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, everything is good, but it would be, easier or better with a partner who's sharing that like you do and you know and uh, you're not lonely and whatever and it's not that we like kind of uh, judging him mm -hmm. or what so but that's what where the topic came up like are we able to talk about it and from what place is it coming and what does it yeah. say about us so we were just it, like it helps, kind yeah. of wondering yeah it helps a lot that that you're giving the specific example Mm -hmm. When he says, I want to find a girlfriend like Sophie and I want to have a relationship like you guys have. Do you do you see clearly that he's projecting what he believes your relationship is? He does not know. He's not with you 24-7. Mm -hmm. And even if he was with you 24-7, he would still view your interaction through his glasses, through his mirror, how he see himself and how he see the world he does not see your relationship he does not even see sophie hmm. he sees a projection of his wishes that he's projecting onto your relationship he see a, a projection of the perfect woman that he's projecting on to sophie and i bet you that projection doesn't have fadi smells 
and doesn't you know leave hair everywhere in the shower <laughs> and doesn't that, she doesn't have any any of that which means mm -hmm. it's not Sophie is it mm -hmm. so so you can be completely calm with him whatever projection he has it's his projection you're not doing anything wrong with being happy in your relationship and you're not being you don't have to burst his bubble at all mm -hmm. because what you think he sees is what you think he sees is not what he actually sees. Obviously, Sebastian, you are so you're so biased because you look at Sophie and go like she is magnificent. Every man on the planet should have a Sophie. You know, of <laughs> course you see that. Of course you see that. So of course it's difficult for you to hear because you know that there is only one, and you know she's yours. So he will never ever find. A perfect Sophie, the one that you think is perfect Sophie. He will probably find his perfect version of a Sophie. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I also see the danger of him completely closing his eyes to the reality that is happening in front of him. You know, that could be an amazing Louise that he's not seeing because she's not exactly like Sophie is. He's, he's looking for for his specific Sophie, not for a Sophie not copy, for, but like yeah. for a very specific <laughs> set of, of skills and, yeah. and, and how, optics how and age. Yeah, should, should be like and, that way, yeah. yeah. And those expectations are in, in the way, like really heavily in yes. the way of finding someone. Um, yeah, and he, he, he's a great guy. He would deserve someone, and it's, yeah. it's painful yeah. to see. It. Yeah, it's like to feel to this, feel this pain. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the pain we can feel. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then that was another thing because I felt like this pain, and I I said like afterwards it makes me feel kind of heavy. Yes. But maybe yeah. uh, it's like if I talk about it now, um, I've gone through phases where mm. I felt I need someone. Uh, to be happy otherwise i will not be happy ha happy mm. so it is probably that i can see or feel his happiness in that yes so that is my kind of projection and maybe it's even not uh, happiness but also he is saying a lot about other people that he sees a kind of heavy energy yeah. and when he says that i feel like yeah but you're in heavy energy as well so it doesn't make sense he's himself He's, he's yeah. projecting his heavy energy onto other people. Mm -hmm. There's there's some reason why he in his life right now is diverting, 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 diverting. There's something that is beginning to surface in his life that he's not ready to look at. And he's diverting. And right now he's diverting with looking for the perfect partner mm -hmm. that we know doesn't exist. I mean, the perfect partner is only perfect if that person is confident enough in themselves to be themselves and we happen to love them being themselves that is the perfect partner so there's no certain set of a perfect partner but he's not ready to see that he probably looks for the perfect partner so he can become perfect without him doing any work to becoming perfect mm -hmm. he's thinking that he needs to be perfect you know the way mm -hmm. that he is is not okay but if he gets a partner, then he will be okay. Then he will spend his Sundays, you know, the right way that he's supposed to spend a Sunday instead of how he is spending a Sunday. Mm. So he's projecting all the things that he thinks he is not onto her and she will bring that to the table and then life will be good. And he he doesn't need to go to therapy. It's a win. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's uh, what, what I want to say because a, a part of uh, her is like uh, she should be done with uh, all issues, like kind of be a happy yeah. person. And then he adds, like, like I am. And for me, I feel like, well, how can anyone ever be ready? I mean, that's uh, great if that happens, but uh, what is this kind of expectation that anyone is happy and, uh, and anyone is ready with everything to deal with? And uh, yeah. So. yeah. so 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 do you guys see that that he's projecting onto that fantasy woman all the things that he's not? Yeah. Yeah, so but uh, it was also like 
uh, we were wondering, is it okay to see this projection? Like, where is our identification in that? So it's in that, for example, you can only recognize the heaviness in him when you acknowledge the heaviness in you. Otherwise, it would just feel uncomfortable. Mm. The moment that we are with other people and we feel, yeah, yeah and we <laughs> feel, you know, that it's, you know, we feel fearfulness or we feel annoyance or we feel, and we're completely clear on the feeling that we have is arising in us is because of something they do. So we just, we pick up on them. Otherwise, it would just be like, no, I don't like to be with Jeffrey. I don't like that. I don't like that. And we don't know why. We just don't like it. Then we are diverting, diverting, diverting. And there's something that we're not looking into. That you, Sophie, can mm -hmm. see. I get heavy when I'm with him. It's because you recognize your heaviness in him. It's still your heaviness. But you have mm -hmm. been in the room where you're heavy. You have been in the room where you have depression. You have been in the room where you have, you know, you need the world to be in a certain way in order for you to be happy. You have been in that room, which means that you recognize it in him. So mm. you can only recognize it when you've been in the room. So it is your projection, but that doesn't mean that he's not heavy. Mm -hmm. And it also doesn't mean that there's anything like wrong with it, right? Like it you can be with him in the room, feel his heaviness, hold that with compassion. Yeah. Maybe even if he, if he asks, give him some honest advice from your heart, and there's no necessarily a, like wrongful identification with the process going on within us. Um, or is it? Yeah, no, 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 no. It's it's beautiful. I love it. Um, I spoke with a friend um, about a group where it's only people that have that have seen through self, and they are. They are guiding one another and they enter the group with the goal of supporting and helping another person. So it's like a paid forward group, if you can say it like that. So nobody comes to the group to be guided. Everybody's there to guide the others. And we it's like a fantasy group that I really would like to have at some point. Um, and I spoke with my friend about it and, and where he said that, yeah, but you have to remember that people that are in the six feather will only have the starting point of everything from the sixth feather. They will only look at there is no subject object. Mm -hmm. People that are working with the fifth feather, they will see that what are you trying to change in the other person because that is what you're working with when you work with the fifth feather. People that are in the seventh feather, they will see, well, you can change the time. You can, you're in the fourth dimension where time doesn't exist. So how can you dissolve this issue that you're in? And that's the problem when we speak that we speak from the point that we're at. So when you're in the 10th feather and you don't know anything, that is what you're sitting with. He's allowed to have whatever feeling comes up. Who am I to know anything? And that's the level of usefulness I could give. You know what I mean? And then you step, but so then then you step the talking. Have I ever stopped talking? <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet you could, could give him great advice. I mean. Probably, probably, and maybe not. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Who knows? If yeah. if if he's up for one to one with Todd, have him book one. You know, but I he, mean, he, he he would he would need to he would need to know about the feathers in order for us to be able to help him. You know, he would need to be willing to look through the identification of self. And if he's not interested in that, we are not the right ones. He's a 20 years Buddhist Vipassana, one hour meditation every day, uh, but he has done the Angelo online retreat with me now. And that, that changed his, that, like he was like, whoa. Wonderful. How what is this? The beliefs, what, what, what the, the beliefs I have, they, 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 they scared him a little bit, but yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Also, he's. It's very nice to spend time with him. I just wanted to mention it because he's, he's, he's very, yeah. he's no, very we, warm. Beautiful person. Um, a person, people are wonderful. We pass the people are wonderful, absolutely wonderful to be with. See if he if he understands English good enough to to do the curriculum, so we can walk through that, and have him come to the Q and A here or to the increase of, and then see see what happens. 
see what happens. But you guys need to be very clear that whatever you see is your projection. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just how it is. The eyes sit in your head. The ears are attached to you. So it can't. But it, but it, it, uh, it helps or it's what I uh, understood that it just can be from the past because I was like, is it present now? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's there at the moment or is it still there? So seeing that in him doesn't mean like you we know, have that issue with each other necessarily. No, be, I guess no, we... no. It's it's just yeah. what you see. Like I said, the heaviness that you pick up, it it's yeah. it's now that you feel that heaviness and you are okay with the heaviness. You're not diverting mm -hmm. from the heaviness, which means you're you're fine with it. You've been in that room. Mm -hmm. Be mm -hmm. where heaviness is present. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But but so make no mistake, it's your heaviness. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. And that, that that is actually where a relationship becomes really, really good, because that is where you completely set the other person free. Mm -hmm. That the other person can be in a funk. I'm Todd. He he was he has had some days where he's been in a funk where he hasn't like. It hasn't been okay, and he hasn't been able to say what was okay or wasn't okay. There was there was just a lot of things happening in the body. I have no need for him not to be in a funk. Hmm. He can be in a funk as long as he wants to. It doesn't change anything. Can that, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we have like yeah, uh, go. so when when so when Sophie is annoyed by me letting uh, my my uh, old underpants laying around in the room. <laughs> I mean, she's, she would never be uh, uh, aggressive about it or anything, but uh, like sharing that I feeling got activated. of feeling that sh sharing that feeling of being annoyed by it with me. So it's her old feeling of not like something like that. Or... Yeah, it's not about the underpants. It's about something else that you're not seeing in her. Something which you are not acknowledging in her that she's annoyed about. It's not the underpants. The underpants are just a manifestation of a feeling. Mm. So Sophie, so Sophie, next time you see the underpants, just stay with the feeling. What is this reminding you of? It's not about the underpants. What is this reminding you of? There's something that Sebastian is not seeing in you. Okay. There's something that he's not meeting in you. And it's not about Sebastian. He's just the person you're projecting it onto. Mm. So it's not about the other one. It's not about Sebastian. It's something in you that he's not meeting that you need to meet. I was thinking uh, about, like, I was thinking about it because I could feel like, okay, it is activating me, but I can see it's not a problem. So I came like, uh, that was my explanation <laughs> for it, that it can be from my childhood and uh, that in our house uh, everything needed to be tidy or was not allowed uh, to go. to leave uh, things around and so I was like okay maybe probably that's the belief uh, it needs to be tidy otherwise we are like messy people Ooh, there we go. Tidy. okay <laughs> so next time next time you see the underwear on the floor then you mm -hmm. say apparently Sebastian and I are messy people how does it feel for me to be a messy person and be in a relationship with a messy, messy person? How does that feel? What does it do in me? Clearly, you're back in your childhood. Mm -hmm. What was it that you thought that you now mm -hmm. had to do, 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 do to be okay? So mm -hmm. if you have to do, 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 he also has to do, do, do. You can't be the only one doing everything. He needs to carry his load. Yeah. That's, and that's another thing, like uh, why he doesn't see it. So I, I came, I made up. Yeah, he just didn't see it. It's like uh, it's not in his. It doesn't bother him. So it's not a problem. Uh, it's just a problem for me. And obviously, it's uh, yeah, from from my childhood or so whatever. Yeah. But it's it's about you being okay with being messy. It's about you have a projection mm -hmm. of what messy people are. Mm -hmm. You are most definitely not that. <laughs> so you need you need to you need to explore that. What does it mm -hmm. mean to be a messy person? Mm -hmm. you know? And and what you're projecting onto Sebastian that he needs to do so you don't feel that you are. That look into that. Look into that. 
Yeah, and that's a new one. Yeah, so maybe uh, it's like uh, it's a blind spot. Yes. Obviously, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and and be careful with not I'm so happy you guys are bringing it up. And be very be be very careful with not bypassing. It's okay. I'm fine with it being messy. I'm it's not what we're looking for. It's not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. We're looking into that underlying pain that is peeking its head out. Because you will if you look into this and if you give it space, you will reach a point where you will not even see that there's underwear on the floor or you will pick it up without even noticing that that it's an issue. It, it won't be until afterwards that you're going to go, what just happened? Because mm. it, there's there's no there's no um, there's nothing tied to it anymore. There's no mm. you know thing. There's nothing attached to it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I think uh, I can even feel the differences that I have days where I really don't see it and other days where it's more yeah. present. Uh, so, but it's there. Yeah. So definitely. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna, love, I'm gonna to... investigate on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would love to hear about that. I would love to hear about that. How, how that goes. I would love that. And thank you I'm so sure. much, you guys, for being honest. It's really nice. Thank you. It's, it's really I'm nice. Sure very, very soon, Sophie's underwear is also going to be on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> In the lamps, everywhere. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so thank much, you. guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, join the curriculum and be a messy person. Hello, Catherine. Oh, you're muted, my friend. You're muted. You're muted. Hello. Hello. Uh, so good to meet you. Oh, it's so good to meet you. I um, I uh, I am overwhelmed, and I have years and years worth of things to tell you. I have a meeting scheduled with Todd for February thirteenth. Good. And um. I really, I just want to introduce myself to all of you. And I want to tell you that I am, I am, I am so deep in this swamp of uh, uh, believing, um, I'm just sure of it, that I was responsible for the, um, not only the sexual abuse and the physical abuse, but the destruction of the family unit that I grew up in. And there was a big incident when I was not yet four and my father was arrested yet again for sexual abuse and my mother wouldn't look at me. And so I was all alone. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have, um, my whole life has been spent hiding that person that I believe I am. And at the same time, I'm becoming aware of and feeling great shame and kind of, ugh, um, I have used my pain and what happened to me as an excuse to run away, not be responsible, not take care of myself and many others. Um, and this, this idea of I can't connect with people because I'm not safe. They're not safe, but I'm also not safe. And I know it's a story, but I believe it. Yeah. And and there's a disconnect that happens in my body that I'm very well aware of. And it's this incredible longing for love and acceptance, but it has to come from me. Yes. And I need, I I I um I am announcing this. I'm telling on myself, um, and I'm and I'm very excited about Todd. And I've invited a friend of mine to come with me on that because I don't trust myself to be kind to myself. And <clears throat> there's all kinds of other dramatic things happening in the world today about that. But I just wanted to tell all of you that and ask for your help. Really, whatever love and support. I feel very young. I feel like I'm three and a half. And um, and uh, yeah. Before you start to work with with seeing through self 
and um and looking into that self delusion that we have you need to you need to have established um what i call the five care areas mm-hmm. and it's the it's the part about a that you have a very clear sense of self that you know that you are here and you're safe that needs to be established first the second thing is about the care areas that you eat when you're hungry you drink water when you're thirsty you go to the dentist when it's needed you go to bed when you're tired you go for a walk when you need when the body needs to be moved and and it doesn't happen with any kind of punishment or anything but it just happens out of love and compassion i can recommend you to watch um i've had lots of conversations with glenda um And and I can recommend you to watch the conversations I've had with her because it's very much about exactly feeling into those needs that are that are met um, in the self care. The third one uh, of the care areas is about boundaries. Mm-hmm. It's about having very very clear boundaries, and we have uh, like three layers of boundaries. That the first one is the outer boundary, which is what you have experienced as physical abuse and sexual abuse, intellectual abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse. That is when like the people are trespassing your outer boundary. That needs to be completely clear. The inner boundary is is how you talk to you that we have a tendency to continue the verbal abuse, the intellectual abuse, the psychological abuse. We have a tendency to continue that. That needs to be that boundary needs to be very, very clear as well. So you, when you catch yourself not being nice to yourself, that you just stop a moment and going like, okay, I I love and appreciate you. I love and appreciate you. Whatever comes up, whatever you ju- thought you just had, it's fine. I love and appreciate you. That was what happened with Janine in the beginning of, of the meeting here. Mm-hmm. Um, the inner, inner boundary, the innermost boundary that we have, that is the one that is crossed when when you for example were sexually abused and you knew that you needed to um be okay with it in order to survive as a child in the family that inner boundary was crossed it's what is crossed with um with victims and victims in concentration camps they can have a very strong boundary knowing that it's them who's doing this to us. But the innermost boundary is the one that is, is for example, if the inner boundary is broken, if, if you are asked to shoot one of your friends, it's still the guards that forced you to do it. But the innermost boundary is crossed when you are fed and you are not being shot and you are getting close and you are all of that, but you have to st- stick up with sexual abuse. You have to shoot your friends. You have to, that is when the innermost boundaries cross. Yeah. And those three levels of boundaries need to be okay and be solid before you can really drop the sense of self or drop mm-hmm. the, yeah. Then it's about the fourth one is about self-love. And the last one is about self-worth. And those need to be in place before you start to work with dropping the sense of self. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I have to, um, or I feel called to rescue that little three and a half year old who believes that about herself. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, I, but I feel I want to witness with me when I do that. Yeah. And, but but that's that's what I have to do. And and um, it doesn't help you saying that it was just a story, first of all. Yeah. Because in your in your experience and it in your experience it it happened and you know and it has created you know ripples into your entire life. 
So saying that it was just a story is bypassing and negating what was actually happening. So you need you need to have that foundation in first. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have been um, afraid of feeling what uh, what I felt or what I ignored, what I pushed away. Yeah, I can recommend you to to work with the second feather about mm -hmm. doubt. Um, okay. Work with that first before you work with the first feather, because that that those things need to be in place first. Then there needs to be love and compassion and understanding and um, all of that needs to be in place before you start to dissolve. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome, and thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Sunny, my friend. Hello. Oh, you're muted. I'm here. Yeah, I just couldn't find the unmute button. Uh -huh. Um, it is actually tapping into what Anna said because I have not the same issues, but I also have a daughter that is really good at 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 uh, triggering the points around me that that really brings up that I have to defend myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I see, because I have been talking to you and others about this, I can see that I need to have this unconditional love and, 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 and uh, what do you say? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I need to just apologize to her and, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. And I can I can feel that it also brings a lot of more love into it. Yeah. And it brings a lot of more love into me. Yeah. But like Anna said, then I'm empty. Yeah. Or I'm afraid of being empty. Yeah. So and I couldn't really get what what is it that I besides from making her safe and sure and saying, I love you. It's okay. I'm here even though if she doesn't want to stay here or something, let's say that. But what will I do for helping myself? What it's, is it's it I, no, afterwards? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you're, you're too quick. You're too quick. Um, when we believe that life is a zero-sum game, that means that if I am giving you a compliment or if I'm apologizing to you, the only compliment in the world and the only apology in the world i have just given away which means i'm never going to receive it mm -hmm. so look into that idea that things are conditional but what do i do when i feel that things are conditional you look into you look into the the idea okay so right now i believe that there's not a lo enough love in the world to go around. How does it feel to be in a in a world where there's not enough love to go around? And then you stay with that. You will, like Anna, have lots of do 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 post its write it down on post its stay with the first thing. There's not enough love. But I also feel like a really big uh, pain when it is that that I'm not getting this. And I know that I will my mother my mother and father is dead. Stop, I know stop, that stop, I will stop, never stop, get stop, this. Stop, so stop, 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 stop. We take the pain in a sec. We take mom and dad in a sec. <laughs> One thing at a time. You're too quick. And that is part of the bypassing. This is part of how you maintain the pain. Being in a world where there's not enough, enough love. Can you be in a body where there's a lack of love? <clears throat> is that even possible? I know that the love is not a fixed amount. And it's not that there's just, just because I love my daughter doesn't mean that I doesn't love my son. If mm -hmm. I love her more, I don't love him less. I so, mean, so in you right now, is there love? Yes. 
So can can you be in a world where there isn't any love? No, not if I have it in me. No. If you apologize to your daughter, if you if she comes and say, "Mom, you said it would be sunshine, and today is raining. It's mm. your fault." Yeah. You say, "I'm so sorry, sweetheart. I will see if I can make it better tomorrow." Yeah. What happens? Is the love I'm... changed? It has has that changed at all? No. But I'm so afraid of not being loved myself. Of, but, I'm so afraid of this blame. Stop, yeah, but stop, 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 stop. You're too quick. You're too quick. If you say that you're too afraid of not being loved, where did the love just go? We, we just agreed on that the love is there. Ever, n never changing. It's there. It's there as a foundation all the time. Where did it go? So there was a Sunni with love and then there was a Sunni without love. How, what happened? Are there two Sunnis? <laughs> but I would, can't jump to the conclusion of saying that, that it's, I mean, the love must still be there, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. So the love is still there. Are we? Are we still? Are we still in that boat where we say that love and and contentment is there all the time? Or have we left that boat? Do you feel? No, that I will say it is there, but that's because I say it is there. I'm not sure I can feel it. Okay, right now, if you close your eyes and breathe, do you feel love and contentment? Yeah. Is that conditional of anything? I do. Is that conditional of anything? No, it's... I know it's there. So, what can happen where that is not there? I think I don't feel it because I feel a lot of other things on top. There we go. So does that change the fact that the love and compassion does that does does that love and compassion go anywhere? Or is it just that you're focused on something else? Your it's headlight that I'm, focus, I'm focusing. Yeah. So your headlight is in another direction, the love and compassion is still there. Yeah. So when your headlight is another direction, can you point it back to that like zero point of being? Yeah, I will have, I will try to. And next time I'm in this situation where I totally focus on something else. But also become aware of that there's a difference in the totally focusing on something else. That is usually a thought. Yeah. What you're sitting and talking about is where you're in your body and there's just contentment. It's two different things. The thought is mind, it's just a fantasy. You could think about, you know, the little mermaid as, you know. As but I think it's like, like Anna said, it's that uh, I need to defend myself. I need to make sure I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. That's where my, my focus goes. And then look into that, look into yeah. that underlying belief. Yeah. Because that part needs love and compassion. You come from a, from an environment that is so old, where you have a pattern, where you have repeated it over and over and over that you need to defend yourself. Yeah. That needs compassion. And that way, where you have that feeling that you need to defend yourself, it does not change that underneath all of it, when you close your eyes at any point, you feel contentment. Yeah. You can still feel contentment and look into that underlying belief because there's a part of Sunni that needs to be loved and held and assured. And 
Yeah. And those can happen simultaneously. That 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 the feeling of feeling unsafe. Then, like I did with Anna, then you just stay with that. Can you? What does unsafe mean? Can you be in a body that's unsafe? Whatever label comes up now, whatever post that you add to being unsafe, remove it, remove it, remove it. Stay with being unsafe. And how does it feel in the body to be unsafe? I start to sweat. <laughs> no. lots, yeah. of, lots of energy is releasing. You start to yeah. sweat. You start yeah. to sweat. Yeah, exactly. Lots of energy is releasing. So there's something about being unsafe and an energy release. Yeah. Whatever extra thought you have is a post-it. Write it down and then you take the next post-it. Yeah. The addition, the, the, the first thought is how it is to be unsafe. Yeah. And then you stay with that. How does it feel to be in your body when you're unsafe? Can you be in a body that feels unsafe? Yeah, but I want to do something about it. Do you I want to work this? my way out of it. <laughs> because? I want to work my way out of it. Because? I need to... Because? Why? To, to, to try and do something to feel safe. But the feeling of being unsafe, is that okay? Can you be in a body that feels unsafe? Yeah. Why do you need to change that? Because I normally do that. That's right. my go-to reaction. Amazing pattern. Love it. Absolutely amazing. Right now, can you be in a body where you feel unsafe? Yeah. And then it's just that. That you have a knee-jerk reaction when you feel unsafe to do, do a lot of things so you don't feel that icky, icky feeling. What I'm inviting you to do is, okay, calm down, breathe. Could you sit and just feel unsafe for a moment? And just feel, how does it feel in your body? Is that really so unbearable that you need to divert and divert and divert? Or can you just stay with this feeling of being unsafe? Well, it's just that. And if a lot of thought, but what about my finances? What about my family? I'm going to quit my job. All of that. Write it down and post it. That's for later. That's for later. That's for later. Right now, we're working with sitting with the feeling in the, the sensory experience of being in a body that feels unsafe. Nothing else. Can you be in a body that feels unsafe? Yeah, I will. No, but can you right now? Yes, I can. I can sit here and I can. I can feel the unpleasantness in the body and. Yeah, so could you explain to me how does the unpleasantness feel? It feels like a gap in the chest, like a buzzing sensation in the chest, like. Um... So sit, yeah, sit down and massage it here, where where it feels. Just give lots of love to that area. So this is how it feels to be in Sunni's body that feels unsafe. Can I be in a body where it feels like there's a gap in the chest? Yeah. Do you see there's no need to rush out of this room? There's no need to divert. It's just unpleasant sensation in the chest. Yeah. So there's no need to rush away. There's no need for a knee-jerk reaction. There's no need for diverting in any way. This is a room that you can actually get quite comfortable in. Yeah. So the next time you're in a situation where you feel unsafe, 
you have right now had an experience where it was okay to be unsafe. Oh, this contraction in the chest, the gap that is happening. I know that. I remember sitting with Penilla at the meeting and that was actually okay. I'm there again. Okay. Can I be in a body? Do I need to rush out of the room? I've been here before. Can I just stay here? Yeah. Do you see that when you sit with this sensation of being unsafe, that underneath that gap in the chest, the love and contentment is still there? Yeah. It is there. Yeah. So there's no need to run out and look for love and contentment. It's even in the room of unsafety. Yeah. beautiful oh, thank you <laughs> always enjoyable thank you so much Cindy. thank you last one hi Penilla. hello my friend so um i'm not really sure what the question is there we go um, but maybe maybe one it's more about a mechanism yeah. So it was interesting, um, a little bit, um, I think, in response to what Anna was saying, and also <clears throat> um, when she was talking about uh, being stupid and useless, and you were saying, what does it mean? That I found a bit confusing because I worked with stupid and useless, and I just sat with the feeling of it, of how I felt. Um, well, it led to shame, you know, just to the shame thing. Another label, another label. Yeah. You okay. can shame in a bit. Stay, yeah. you're right now Rovina is stupid and useless yeah definitely um <laughs> and so the other day um there was I was um in a meeting and I um made a contribution but it was a little bit it just afterwards I I felt it was a little bit to the side of the thing, the, of the conversation. And and so afterwards, and I could already feel, ah, you know, you're stupid and useless. And, but I took it later on, I worked with it later on, and it was pretty intense. It was actually all the way down my left, the left side of my body. Wow. And I realized, and it was a little bit like our conversation, that there's this mechanism in me that, um, and that, happens when I'm listening and then maybe there's too much information coming in so then there's a diversion but I haven't even noticed it yeah um it happens sometimes with my husband because he his voice has become very difficult and it's very rasping and sometimes I actually can't listen to it I almost want to flee and say be quiet be quiet be quiet and my mother was a bit like that. She was very shrill and, you know, other kids and things. Um, so the question is more, I mean, uh, I guess there's this sort of sense of being, it's one, it's either being invaded or otherwise I can't stay with um, verbal interactions in a way. Um, and so it's finding like, okay, where is that point yeah. where there's a, um, and so any suggestions, because that is part of the, that is sort of in a way, well, it, to be stupid and useless, okay. And um, that's okay. But also I would like to be able to stay in my body and be present yes. to be able to listen because I know there's a mechanism at play um, that has been playing out for forever. When I we had our little conversation on the YouTube, it's like I can remember like somebody saying, "Oh, you go." I asked the directions, and he says, "You know, go left, right, left, right." And it's like, okay, I'll go left and right, and then I'll ask somebody else because I can't <laughs> retain the information. You know, I can't, but I can't visualize it, and because somehow, give me information coming in, and there's like no can't take it type of thing yeah is that okay is it okay yeah. 
well, it's been okay for all my life. I'm here today. Yeah, I guess. That was a but, very, very, very disguised no. But. Yeah. <laughs> Very, very disguised. No, you came with that. Um, I completely get what you want. And I think every, every, I get what you're saying. And I think everybody recognizes that, you know, that we want something else than what is. Yeah. Uh, when you're in a conversation and you feel that you start to divert, see if you can backtrack a bit. What is it right now that I'm diverting from? Like you said in in the conversation you went where where you felt the diversion sub suddenly happening, see if you can backtrack. What what did that trigger that need for diversion? That's the, yeah. the second thing about where where you simply can't take any more in like directions is like left and a right and then I can't remember anymore. Can you be in a body? where directions needs to be <laughs> in very, very small bites. And that's just how it is to be you. Yeah. Wishing, wishing that you could remember more of the directions. It's just a wish like peace on earth. You know, it's just a wish. It's it's not going to happen. Probably not. Not now. Not, I mean, well, you might hit your head and get amazing memory, but otherwise it's probably not going to happen. So it it's probably one of those things that you just need to be okay with is you. So why isn't it okay? If yeah. you know that that is how you process information, then that's how you process information. I mean, I, me as an autist, having getting the diagnosis and getting to that point where I just acknowledge that there are things I can and things that I can't, and that's just it. There's nothing more to do about that. It's how my brain is wired. So that's how it is. And there's nothing more to say about that, really. No, only that I can feel an, an influx of energy going, coming up to almost like say, yeah. Yeah. But that's so that's being in the body with the sensations and. Yeah. It's because you want the situation to be different, yeah. You want the situation to be different because you can you can stay in the body when somebody says there's a left and a right and a right and a right and then a left and two rights and a left and by the next crossing, then you go in the roundabout to the left. And you know that when they start to the left and the right, that's all you heard. You can still smile, feel what I just talked with Sunni about, you know, the love and, and contentment. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Knowing, well, it's going to be a left and a right, and then I ask the next one. Okay. So when you feel that contraction in the body with an underlying belief of you needing to be different than who you are, look into that. Yeah. It, was that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, it was. For sure. Yeah, just I'm not, I was sort of like pinning on some sort of uh, too much onto the, the sense, this upward sensation of rejection. Label, extra label. Yeah. Remove that, just stay with what is. And then when you have that feeling that you know that you cannot comprehend what is said, too much is said, you can only comprehend a certain amount. Then you get a feeling of something, inadequacy, let's say. You feel inadequate. How does it feel for Rena to be in a body that feels inadequate? Can you be in a body that feels inadequate? And when you get the no, I have to, that's another label. What will happen? People will leave me. Okay, that's another label. Just sit here and be inadequate, Rovina. Can you get comfy in the room of being inadequate? Yeah, it's the expectations to, of being other than an inadequate, which is the problem. Yeah, if we're wanting to be other, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I can see that clearly now. Yeah, and and those expectations I, is the next post-it that you can work with. Yeah. The first one is just to be inadequate. Is that okay? Yeah. And do you also see though in the room of inadequacy there's still contentment? Yeah.
Then it's looking into expectation, and that is a whole nother, another chapter because in expectation you also have the victimhood, and it's a full, yeah, um, thing. yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, great. Love it. Thank you. Love, thank you so much, Romina. Thank you, thank you. And I think that was the last one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and open and honest and looking into all this. I love you guys so much. It's such a joy to be with you. Um, I just want to say uh, two things. One thing is that um, there is a group for people that are working, that have worked with the three foundational feathers. So the first, second, and third feather, they're sorted. They're working with fourth, fifth, and everything beyond. There's a group that is free. It's a closed group, and it's on Saturdays. And if you want to join, you can write to Todd, and he will give you the link for the group. You need to be very, very clear that it's only for working with fourth, fifth, and above. So if you have any issues that is working with selfing or anything about the doubt or anything like that, it's not the group to go to. Go to Vince's group, go to the inquiry group, come here. That's where we can work with that stuff. That feather free, it's called a feather free group. And it's a closed group uh, on Facebook. Todd and I are not in the group. I just want to make that very, very clear. The people that you know from the, the three continents of awakening, most of them are there. Um, and it's a great group to work with and looking into all the identification that you have from fourth feather and up. So if you would like to join that group, then write Todd and he can give you a link so you can join the group. But just be very, very clear that it's not a group to, to go to if you have about the self-identification. That's not the place to go. But anything about that, is, it's a great group. That was the one thing. Uh, just write to Todd and you get the link. Uh, the other thing is, remember on Tuesday that we have the inquiry group. Again, write to Todd and you can get the link. It's the same link as we used last week. So if you already have the link, that's the same link. And that was it. Thank you so much to all of you. Love you guys so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>